Make America pay reparations, Uhuru. All right, this is the second half of the first day of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement National Convention 2019. Yay. And I just want to give a shout out to all the comrades who registered to come to this convention, wanted to make it, but for whatever reason couldn't make it for medical reasons, organizational reasons, et cetera, um, to Stephanie Midler, Peter Yar Yarashak, Laura Donovan, Santosh, Diane Torney, Kristen Forthen, Jake Scott, Johan Bedingfield, and James White. We hope you all are watching on the live stream. And just shout out to everyone watching on the live stream as well, Uhuru. And I just wanted to point out that there are special edition t-shirts for this convention over at the Planet Uhuru um, table where it has our slogan, Make America Pay Reparations, and the Uhuru Solidarity Movement 2019 National Convention, April 13th through the 14th in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, go talk to Hallie over at the Planet Uhuru uh, table during our next break to get your special edition t-shirt. And now I just want to bring back um, Chairwoman Penny Hess, who is going to introduce our next presentation about the Back Power Blueprint, Uhuru. Uhuru, salute to the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Make America pay reparations now, now, Uhuru. Well, it is my honor to, as I said, to be working under the leadership of Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shatella, who has coordinated this incredible project. And I know that so many of you have paid reparations and put in over the last 18 months into this, and we can see the results. It, it is so powerful and so beautiful, and there's so much more than this, and there's so much more that's coming. So this is an endless project, and it is one that is differentiated from anything else that's out there because it is political and economic power in the hands of the African working class. So I just, you know, I just want to say that it is really my honor to to be able to introduce Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shadhello, who we're going to bring up in just a few minutes, that has taken the theoretical understandings that the chairman laid out. Um, specifically in the um, in the, fit, the the sorry the sixth Congress political report and uh, the report to the plenary it was laid out by the chairman of taking properties and, and building political and economic power um, as a real dual and contending power in the hands of the African working class and deputy chair came to St. Louis and just boom transformed it found properties, found the situation that exists here, city-owned properties and other things, and uh, began to purchase them so that they are part of the African Revolution. They are not part of gentrification. And everything that the party has put on, on the ground here is, has created a hope and a vision of this African community, and people love it very much. So, um, you know, I just, I really want to salute Deputy Chair, I want to say that working under her leadership is an honor, and it is a very great, great training. She has a very strong BSO meter, and she tolerates no foolishness whatsoever. She calls on you to be your very, very best, and that is powerful. And she has built a cadre, a cadre of forces in the party and in APSC who are um, out there carrying out on the ground reparations, which is a front of the party's strategy that the political and economic are one and, and power must be in the hands of the African working class. So I just want to say that. It's an honor to be able to welcome her. And first, we're going to show a couple of videos. I believe that the first one is the first one, the coal train. Well, I was on uh, quite a bit or part of the All Diamonds or Blood Diamonds tour, and we showed this video. And it was like the more I saw it, the more I wanted to watch it. It is so powerful. It's so beautiful. Um, it, really, it really portrays what the African People's Socialist Party is about. And also, on top of the, of, of the beautiful music and, and the political ideas, I really love that the chairman is narrating it, too. It's very powerful to see that. So, Uhuru, let's watch this incredible video. Put together by Charles Oliver, I want to say. Who is, yeah. The 
There's a train that comes from Namibia and Malawi. There's a train that comes from Zambia and Zimbabwe. There's a train that comes from Angola and Mozambique. From Lesotho, from Botswana, from Swaziland. From all the hinterlands of Southern and Central Africa, this train carries young and old African men who are conscripted to come and work on contract in the gold and mineral mines of Johannesburg and its surrounding metropoli. 16 hours or more a day for almost no pay. Deep, deep, deep down in the belly of the earth, when they are digging and drilling for that shiny, mighty, evasive stone, or when they dish that mishmash mash food into their iron plates with the iron shovel, or when they sit in their stinky, funky, filthy, flea-ridden barracks and hostels, and they think about the loved ones they may never see again because they might already have been forcibly removed from where they last left them, or wantonly murdered in the dead of night by roving and marauding gangs of no particular origin, we are told. They think about their lands and their herds that were taken away from them with the gun and the bomb and the tear gas and the gatling and the cannon. And when they hear that choo-choo train, a chugging and a pumping and a smoking and a pushing and a pumping, crying and a steaming and a chicken and a what? They always curse and they curse the coal train, the coal train that brought them to Johannesburg. blueprint because we are very serious about overcoming the grave disparities in this country and city between the conditions faced by our white people and by African. The Black Power Blueprint is a struggle for African community economic and political power. It is against the system that is responsible for our poverty and powerlessness. It is this powerlessness that is responsible for the fact that the average household wealth for a white family is 22 times greater than the wealth of an average African household. It is the absence of power that is responsible for the huge gap in the lifespan of African and white people in the U.S. and in St. Louis. There are few African created job opportunities in our community. We are confronted with massive decay of the housing stock that has been left unattended and which is difficult for the African population to acquire for shelter and industry. We are opposed to the idea that the best response to these conditions is some kind of welfare. We are convinced that the best approach to the development of our communities is self-determination power in the hands of our community. We believe in reparations from white people to repair the historic theft of labor and resources from black people. These resources form the basis of social wealth inherited by generations of white people at our expense. We believe that reparations from white people is a positive stand that allows white people to join in genuine solidarity with African people and the majority of humanity. This approach differs from those who only focus on handouts. We believe that an equitable return of resources that goes directly into programs that provide collective economic empowerment is the best and just way forward. 
even black elected officials are incapable of truly representing our communities because of the absence of an independent community economic base. This fact makes black politicians more susceptible to the wishes of white capitalists and big money interests over the interests of our impoverished communities. The Black Power Blueprint allows for everyone, African people ourselves, as well as our friends, to achieve a dignified success that upholds the integrity of our community and contributes to stabilizing development that serves black working people. As a consequence, this will benefit the entire city in a thousand different ways. This is why we need Black Power Blueprint. That is an amazing video, and I want to salute the Woo! office of deputy chair. And I want to salute Charles Oliver from the Office of Deputy Chair, who is an incredible videographer, among many other things, graphic designer, who uh, works in, in Deputy Chair's office, who made that beautiful, beautiful film. And of course, that the music is the late, great Hugh Masekela and his incredible song, Stamela. And uh, it is just a beautiful context. And again, it was fantastic to hear the chairman's narration with Hugh Masekela in the background. I love that film. Uhuru. So I think we have another one coming up right now. North of the infamous Del Mar Divide is the other St. Louis, where 70% of those living in poverty are African and hunger is a daily reality. The Black Power Blueprint has brought real hope back to this community, opening up opportunities for economic development and the revival of African culture for which St. Louis is famous. Last year, with tremendous worldwide support and community volunteers, an abandoned and dilapidated building at 4101 West Florissant was rapidly transformed into a thriving Uhuru House Community Center. <laughs> Condemned buildings across the street from the Uhuru House were demolished, and the lot will soon be paved and fenced with lighting for the One Africa, One Nation Community Marketplace. A 50-foot flagpole was erected on this land, flying a 25-foot red, black, and green African flag. Renovations on the third floor of the Uhuru House are wrapping up for additional office and program space with insulation, drywall, and mudding and tape. In the next few weeks, the wiring, plumbing, and flooring will be completed in a fourplex apartment building, earmarked for housing for our African Independence Workforce Program, creating jobs for those re-entering our community from the prison system. We will upgrade all bathrooms and kitchens, install stoves, refrigerators, cabinets, and fixtures, and the apartments will be furnished. 
other projects for phase three include architectural plans, new roofing, and new windows for the beautiful Jico Kitchen, located in an art deco building on Goodfellow Boulevard that had once been a boat dealership. As our most ambitious project so far, Jico will include a cafe, bakery, community kitchen, and the headquarters of Wapuru Foods and Pies, one of the 26 economic institutions of the Black Star Industries and African People's Education and Defense Fund around the U.S. This is, this is not just to set up some kind of institution. This is a project in the hands of the African working class, and the class has to have power for us to be free. This life-changing project is coordinated by Deputy Chair Ona Zene Ishitela. It is really inspiring to see how much the people love this project and looking forward to the marketplace and all the other projects. This is a positive response to gentrification because it's about more than just keeping our community. It's about building economic self-reliance for our community. The Black Power Blueprint is economic power in the hands of the African working class. Donate to this unique project, which is changing the world day by day. now and it is so beautiful it is so beautiful so without further ado i want to bring up deputy chair onus and asia tella can i change i'm not supposed to touch the mic right <laughs> uhuru comrades i just really really um I'm just really humbled to be here at the Uhuru Solidarity Movement Conference today. And I just want to say that just, you know, looking, you know, at these videos that, that are not even two years old, this building is not even two years old. So we built, we rebuilt this building in, I don't know, 10, 11 months. You know, this is incredible. This whole wall was gone in the back. If you saw the video, it was gone. Bathrooms didn't exist, none of this existed. And we did it in less than 10 months because we knew that we had a deadline for uh, the Blackest Bag was the first uh, organization to have their, their conference here. And then the second organization to have their conference here was the Uhuru Solidarity Movement Conference. So we're back here again a year later in the same spot. So I'm, I'm really, really, I'm really excited. I just really wanted to, you know, really acknowledge my leadership, who is Chairman Amalia Shatella. I just really want to just say to you that I just really appreciate, I just appreciate you, Chairman. You know, even though we have the same last names, I think that even coming into this movement, you know, has brought a lot out in me. You know, it's not just about, you know, me as a woman, but it's is me as an African trying to overturn the system that has oppressed us for over 600 years. And I just want to really appreciate your leadership. And we're going to do this in your lifetime. We're going to overturn this. And I just um, I want to acknowledge uh, other NCC members in the room, uh, Director Akili Adnai. I just, I just really appreciate your leadership. And you know, like was stated, Agiprop is like the second largest institution of the party and you have a tremendous job ahead of you and you have done such a tremendous job and I want to acknowledge Olafin who is our uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the Burning Spirit newspaper and I just it's just this work makes you really understand what the fight is about you know it's not about me as an individual it's about it's, it's bigger than us and I want to acknowledge President Columbayi and Tanette um, as well, we just, about two weeks ago, we had our uh, African National uh, Women's Organization uh, conference here, and it was just incredible. Um, this organization is led by uh, Ijide Omarilla, who is a tremendous leader, and she fights for African women on every front. I just really wanted to acknowledge that. 
And one of the things, I actually spoke at that conference, and I was tasked to, um, you know, really just humanize myself, because people think that, you know, that you got to be brilliant to be in this organization and, you know, carry out different things. And I'm just an ordinary African working class woman. And I was tasked to really, you know, put together um, my life, you know, uh, growing up as a child and, you know, telling people about who I was. And it was very challenging. I uh, actually created a video and just thinking about all the things that has happened in my life and uh, looking at where I am today, uh, it's just crazy because if I can do it, you can do it as well, and, and, that, and that's one of the things that I really wanted to express in that video because we all have something to bring to the table. And just like Chairman was saying earlier that, you know, um, a lot of people that are in this audience work directly under my leadership, and I think I've worked with mostly, I think everybody, almost everybody in this room except for the new people, and I'm really looking forward to um, doing that. And I just really uh, want to acknowledge, um, you know, the Black Power Blueprint, because like I said, it's not even two years old yet. And uh, coming to St. Louis, um, I was tasked to come to St. Louis uh, to find this Ahura house, and I did that. And really looking at the terrain around me, I understood that if I went back to St. Petersburg, you know, where our national office is located, that this Uhura House may may not have happened as quickly as it did. So I just told, I called the chairman and I said that, you know, I really want to start work right away to really make this happen because, you know, I understood, you know, what was around us and we really wanted to build here in St. Louis. And so I was here uh, a year and a half uh, uh, to make this happen, and I just really want to uh, recognize, you know, USM and APSC, the Solidarity Movement, who have played a tremendous role in helping to bring the question of reparations in the forefront and bring reparations to this project. Um, I also um, really want to um, just say that it's 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 a tremendous job that you have in front of you, and. Uh, and I'm so glad so many of you have taken up this role to really uh, commit yourself to something bigger than yourself, because it is. And like the chairman said, the whole world is changing right now, and you're on the, you're on the cusp of making history, you know, because uh, it was a time where, um, you know, when we were marching down the streets, you know, people were looking at us like crazy, here they go, marching again. But now, you know, everybody's marching against imperialism, against colonialism. So I just wanted to, you know, just really say that and just, um, and just say that this is not my forte. I'm, I'm not, um, I'm more of a person that wants to be in the background doing the work. I am. <laughs> this is not my forte speaking in front of people, but I know as the, you know, a member of the party that this is required. This is something that we have to fight against the things that we don't want to do and don't want to um, accomplish. You know, we just want to, especially uh, women, you know, in general, you know, we always want to be in the background. But the African People's Socialist Party said that we have to be everything that we can be. And we can be, and I've seen this in each and every one of you that I've worked with. You know, I'm so glad to see people like uh, Ruby, uh, who's, uh, who's, Ruby, can you stand? <laughs> who's uh, been in the furniture store, who helped build the furniture store from the ground up and has been in this movement for, I don't know, 30 years plus. You know, I just was so happy to turn around this morning and see you. I just want to also recognize um, Chairwoman Penny Hess, I, I can't even, I can't even um, even say, you know, enough about Chairwoman Penny Hess. I mean, this woman has sacrificed everything to, you know, be on the front lines, li line for African people and just the liberation of Africa itself. And I just really want to acknowledge you and really appreciate you and your role that you played in uh, building, being the first white woman to take the stand. That's just like... Incredible, and I just really want to salute you for that. Uhura. I want to also appreciate, um, when I first uh, came to St. Louis, um, you know, we have been building on the ground for um, 
you know, since the uh, murder of Mike Brown in uh, 2014, and uh, we had already established the International People's Democratic Uhura Movement here on the ground. And um, the chairman brought, uh, sent me here to actually help, you know, bring that political and economic to one, you know, by creating uh, institutions on the ground. And um, I was here by myself, and I met with the chairman and Chairwoman Penny, and I said that I needed um, a comrade to come here, and she answered the call. Kitty Riley, I don't know if you're in the building or not. Stand up. You know, Kitty Riley, my comrade. <laughs> Kitty and I have been together since I actually uh, came into, um, uh, when I was appointed uh, over the economic work. Uh, I work with Kitty along with Janice Kent, who was here from St. Petersburg too. Stand up, Janice. You know, um, I've worked side by side with these comrades that, and, and um, they've taught me a lot and I've taught them a lot. And uh, we've built, you know, some incredible uh, institution. And I just want to say the foundation had, was already here before I got here. And the chairman's political reports to the, the fifth Congress, the sixth Congress, and now the seventh Congress has laid the foundation for me to even stand up here to even say that all the things that we've accomplished and we still have a lot of work to do. And I'm just so proud um, to be, you know, here um, in this work. And I also, I, you know, I have a lot of people that I want to acknowledge, but I do want to acknowledge this comrade who um, has taken uh, the theory of African internationalism and just, you know, sweeping St. Louis and has, you know, joined the ranks of the African Revolution, has uh, fully, full-time joined the ranks. And um, just, you know, even me leaving St. Louis, going back to St. Petersburg has, you know, led this process you know, in my absence, to Chara Masumba, can you stand, please? Uhura. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm going to be quick because, um, you know, like I said, this is not my forte, but um, I'm going to be quick. <laughs> I just want to say um, it's great to be here with the Uhura Solidarity Movement Convention. For our party, this gathering is more like a victory lap than a convention. Mm -hmm. It's a gathering that has come in the midst of white ruling class and many of its representatives acknowledging our influence by attempting to get in front of the issue of our party and those of you here who have spent decades working to make it real. Suddenly, out of the blue, it appears that some of the representatives of the ruling caste has discovered reparations. <laughs> Being a socialist has also, uh, also become fashionable. Can you believe it? You know, I thought, you know, we got Uzi, we got Planet Uhuru, now all of a sudden revolution is fashionable. <laughs> Reparations are now being discussed because, because the system is in trouble and because of all the hard work that we have done. Guess what? Reparations are real. 4101 Rest Forreston is reparations. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we didn't wait for the Democratic Party of the, ruler, uh, the white ruling class to make it happen. Black Power Blueprint is reparations in action and it's happening under the leadership the, of the advanced detachment of, of the African working class. We are fighting for reparations and socialism for decades before the opportunists in the electoral arena had the courage to publicly mention either issue. The fight that they do today is because of the effectiveness of the work of our party through the solidarity movement. It has been our party and movement that has changed the political landscape, that has made it possible and necessary for representatives of the Democratic Party and other opportunists to try and win the masses of people who are being shown the way forward by our example. The opportunists can talk about reparations today because tens of thousands of North Americans has walked into our institutions throughout the U.S. that probably called them to join the solidarity through reparations. And I just want to say, um, this year we're going to be celebrating uh, 25 years uh, in Philadelphia and 30 years in Oakland, California, the Hoover Furniture Stores. So this is no small deal, you know. This is um, dual and contending power. The, you know, Chairman created dual and contending power back in 1978, I think it was. So we're, you know, we're setting the course because, like the Chairman said, we are here to govern. We're we're not playing around. Uh, 
So tens of thousands have supported Black Power, the Black Power Blueprint, precisely because they saw it as a call to give reparations to Africans through support for a campaign led by the African working class that has boldly delegated that the road to socialism is painted black. However, we must be clear, one of the things that makes our demands for reparation different from those of all the opportunists is the fact that we, are, we understand that the political and economic are one. We are not asking for charity. We are calling on all who will join, will do so to join our fight against colonial capitalism by giving reparation in support of the anti-colonial struggle of the African working class to capture political power over our lives and our future. Obviously, there is much more to be done. Our chairman is traveling the world, winning more Africans to the revolution, and the opportunists are helping to open the door to many, including elements of the bourgeoisie who can see the handwriting on the wall to contribute to our struggle for self-determination in their own self-interest. The opportunists will also attempt to provide white people and the bourgeoisie with an alternative to reparations in the form of some kind of charity or a new poverty program. Our work, your work, will make this possible. Now's the time to work harder than ever. We have come so far to let our accomplishment be stolen by opportunists. And no matter what the intentions of the opportunities is, opportunists is raising, reparation and socialism, we know that this time is our time. We will never go back. Like the chairman said, the genie is out of the bottle and we are winning. Reparations now, unity through reparations. Uhuru. 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 of the deputy chair, give another round of applause. And it's so amazing, you know, being from Portland and coming to St. Louis and being able to touch the, the Who House for the first time, I think it was last year during the convention for me, and to see where your reparations is going and the difference between dual and contending power and charity and a handout is just so, so vital in this movement. And you may be wondering right now, how can I support more? How can I um, give more to the projects that are coming up in St. Louis? Well, I'm gonna invite Ben from the St. Louis chapter, a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement to tell you more. Uhuru. Uhuru, everyone. I'd like to introduce Casey Mackey, also known as DJ Reparations, also, also known as uh, Joey Cadre. Um, they are my direct leadership of the St. Louis Uhuru Solidarity Movement branch. Uh, they are a part of the African People's Solidarity Committee, and they are the Midwest Regional Coordinator of USM, and inspire profound unity with reparations to African people. I am proud to work alongside her and call her my comrade. Please welcome to the podium, Casey Mackey. <laughs> I just want to say that Ben is also known as Ella Cadre um, and is the outreach and membership, new membership coordinator of the local St. Louis branch of USM and a powerful example of organizing in the white community. They love the party, they love the people, and they express that enthusiastically all the time. Um, I'm also ecstatic to have on stage with us Rowan Long, a dynamic, yes.
just a really dynamic young supporter of the movement of reparations to African people. He was a volunteer along with his family in the Black Power Blueprint NTU Volunteer Brigade work coordinated by Tacharwa Masimba um, that was essential for renovating the building that we're sitting in right now and was also a featured speaker at the world's first day of reparations to African people uh, right here in St. Louis. So many of you here and online generously contributed to the victories on the economic front and all the advances made by the party in 2018 with your donations of time and resources. What the party put in place in 2018 forwards the struggle for African self-determination, liberation, and revolution. And we have some special guests. Um, well, I just firstly want to um, honor the leader and founder of the Uhuru Movement, um, who is a profound revolutionary theoretician without whom we would you know, not even be here today. We want to give a special gift to our chairman, Chairman Omala Yeshitela. So, he's a beautiful, beautiful Marcus Garvey tote bags. We thought that the Marcus Garvey tote bags would be appropriate because the African People's Socialist Party is the modern day Garveyite movement. And we also want to give one of these special bags and other gifts to, of course, the, um, I, first I want to salute the amazing presentation that just happened by Deputy Chair Onazine Yeshitela. And we want to gift you with one of these bags as well. So, Uhuru. And we want to honor the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee who has inspired all of us in this room to take this stance, Chairwoman Penny Hess. I also want to um, present some of our gifts to all the party members in the room. We are extremely honored to share this room with you. So if we could um, pass out the gifts to Director Akile Anai, Uhuru, <laughs> President Kalambai and Danette, <laughs> Olafi and Akimba, we have David Lance. Abdullah Mohammed. Malika Alexander, Tacharwa Masimba, and Fofi Akibalan. Uhuru. And we also, of course, want to give some of these special give backs to the coordinator for this entire beautiful convention and the chair of Uhuru Solidarity Movement, Jesse Neville. <laughs> So now um, we have a special limited edition Uhuru Solidarity Movement lapel pins to give in recognition for all of our 2018 sustaining donors who are here today. When you hear your name, uh, come on up, um, but please hold your applause till all names have been said. All right, here we go. <laughs> Lisa Watson, Carly Spurlock, Kitty Riley, Right, yes, yeah, yeah. come on up, folks, come on up. Uh, my, myself, <laughs> I'll grab it soon. Uh, Connor McGuire, yes. Hallie Murray, Valerie Bronte, David Rold, Ann Hirsch, Janice Kant, Can't. Can't. Jackson Hollingsworth, Rose Latoul, Ruby, oh man, G Gittleson, Gittleson? okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. Casey Mackey, Ron Hudson, CC Yeomans, or, or humans, um, humans, yep, there we go. Stephanie Midler, Wendy Craig, Paula Lipsy, Carrie Porter, Michael, Micah Del Rosario, 
Laura Donovan, Gil Obler, Carrie Simon, Lane Eni Beckert, and Jeff Rosenzweig. There we go. All right. I also want to um, give a special shout out to our um, longtime sustaining donors who are not here today, which is, and they need a big round of applause, um, John McMasters, Uhuru, <laughs> Kristen Forthen, who is watching online, shout out uh, Spokane, and, uh, and Mark Anderson, Uhuru. <laughs> Really, really incredible donors that have so much unity with African liberation. I also want to shout out um, the Ella Baker sustainers that we have in attendance who are people that give um, $100 a month um, and to the Uhuru Solidarity Movement as part of our pledge to the party. And that is Ali Ayello, Rose, our MC. <laughs> Janet Van Fleet in the building. And Michael Mears, Uhuru. If you didn't, if you, we called your name and you didn't come up, you should, you should. Alrighty, so now everyone who hasn't come up but is here today, come on up for a special convention pen to show our appreciation for all that you do. Uhuru. And it, it says, um, oh. make America pay reparations. Yeah. And it's got a highlighter. What? I know, I know. So when you're reading your copy of Vanguard, you can highlight all the important parts about reparations. And this is, yeah, it's a pen, not to be confused with pen, the other one, pens. Pens and pens, okay. So, so yeah, if you haven't, if you didn't get a pen, but you're a convention attendee, I see, you know, Dylan, some of those out in the crowd, y'all can definitely come get your Uhuru. All right, comrades. We came here to make America pay reparations, so let's do it. Yes! By the time by the time we leave this room, we together collectively are going to raise $10,000 in reparations to African People Socialist Party. We're gonna do it. Revolutionary confidence, we got this. We are gonna make this commitment as an organization to fulfill our mandate to stand in material solidarity with the struggle of African people to reclaim all their stolen resources back in their bout that even the white ruling class is talking about reparations like Forbes magazine and the Democratic Party. And they're talking about how we need to have an agenda for reparations because they see the growing demand from the people, um, not just the African masses, but white people. That, there's a rising number of white people that support this. And so the ruling class is trying to stave it off as long as possible. And I want to say that the crisis of imperialism means that imperialism is even more dangerous. Um, it's going to lash out because it's going to do everything it can to survive. And we already see it lashing out. We see it with Donald Trump and the attacks on the Mexican people and the murders of African people by police and white vigilantes and just the horrors all over the whole world. You know, the U.S. Um, you know, threatening to overthrow, making plans to overthrow the government of Venezuela and causing mass starvation. Uh, so when we see all this happening in the world, we can't can't just sit back. We have to do something. Because white people, we could just walk away. We could just live our lives as normal. But like, would we be human beings if we, if we ignored what was happening? This is the price of our white lives. And I just want to you know, make this call to make America pay reparations a tribute to all Africans killed under colonialism. And that this project happening right here in St. Louis is happening miles away from where Mike Brown was murdered. And I'd been to protests in response to this murder. And then when I met this movement, I you know, learned to go beyond protest. And if our solidarity, if we're really disturbed by what's happening is to, you know, it has to be material putting our money where our mouth is. We cannot deny the material reality that we live on the stolen resources. And once we acknowledge that, and not only that, but take action, which this movement has given us the capacity to do, it's so uplifting. 
these programs of the Black Power Blueprint that we just saw are so positive. This is providing employment and institutions by and for African people so that their resources and value of their labor power actually stay within their community instead of being extracted to build the white community. And African people clearly have the ability to build these projects with the necessary resources. But the, the contradiction is that the resources are in our white communities. So that's what we mean when we say reparations is turning them over so that African people can build up their own community. So it's not, and it's not just about the economics of it and the money, it's connected to a political struggle for power and reclamation of culture and just getting to live in St. Louis and you know be a part of this project and seeing the Sunday rallies and the poetry nights and the fashion shows and you know there's gonna be free yoga here starting soon, that at this Uhuru House, that's just really inspired me to reaffirm my commitment to reparations because I see that it's not just about, you know, an amount, but what actually is happening with it under the leadership of the Vanguard Party. It's so powerful and it's so necessary. It needs to be happening all over the world and white people have a role in that. So as Jesse said earlier, reparations is not a punishment. It is an invitation from the peoples of the world to white people to join with them in the struggle against white power and build a new world. Yeah. It's revolutionary stance. It's how we look in the mirror and see a revolutionary staring back at us. Reparations is our redemption. It's also our liberation. If we want to show our hatred for the ruling class who are disgusting and passing bills that allow discrimination against LGBTQ people and disabled people, you know, the white ruling class that denies the basic right of health care to the masses of people and housing, you know, reparations is the ultimate way to say, you know, F you. So especially when they expect us to continue to be complicit with their hideous system enacting genocide. So all over the world, oppressed peoples are rising up and the system is collapsing and reparations to overturn the system and build a new one led by the African working class is the most legitimate investment in your child's future that you can make. We're talking about a new world under construction in which all human beings can live, and we can't take for granted that everything we do to build the Uhuru movement is connected to oppressed people all over the world. And the indigenous people struggle to reclaim the land that belongs to them. And here's a picture of Union Del Badio, who have been working with the African People's Socialist Party for over 25 years. Every time we, we win a friend to come to one of events and, and contribute resources and become a member or upgrade their sustainership or make reparations a bigger part of our budget, that is connected to um, you know, the rocks thrown by Palestinian people at the terrorist Israeli military. It is connected to the whole anti-colonial struggle is happening. And uh, every dollar to the African People's Socialist Party is connected to the Haitian protesters resisting corruption and poverty and austerity. It's connected to the whole worldwide struggle. So we can't take this for granted. This is really big. This is not just donating to another organization. This is about collapsing imperialism. And as the chairman has said, Quote, reparations are owed because of parasitic capitalism and the theft of African people's labor, land, and resources. Through the reparations demand, white people can consciously participate in the assault on white nationalist capitalism and colonialism. Every dollar we give today is one less dollar going to capitalism and one more dollar going to the only force that can destroy capitalism, which is the liberated black power worker economy of Black Star Industries. That is why we say make America pay reparations. 10,000 strikes against parasitic capitalism. That's what we need to get behind. That's why we're gonna raise this money today. And I just wanna turn it over to Ben to give a statement, Uhuru. Comrade Casey, thank you so much that, for that very, very powerful statement. I completely unite. Um, it is so good to see everyone here. I feel extremely honored to be in this sacred revolutionary space that is black power and self-determination manifested, the Uhuru House. Uhuru. So before Common Rowan speaks, I want to share a little bit about what brought me to this point to be with you all here in solidarity today. 
Uh, so growing up, uh, graduating college and trying to make it in the so-called real world, I was a very typical cis white working class slash lower middle class male. I had all my issues, all the childhood and family stuff. I was plagued by white existentialism and a feeling that nothing truly mattered and that everything was just chaos and hopelessness. I would ask myself daily, what's my purpose in life? Or what should I do with my life? All while feeling a constant failure. I felt pulled by the different stresses of present day capital, colonial capitalism. I felt a constant pressure to have to fight to climb up to keep participating in that rat race chain. And I'd wake up in my bed time and time again and hear the news and see my community and things were just awful. And not 15 minutes away from my apartment, I could cross the Del Mar Divide that I've known about ever since arriving here in St. Louis 19 years ago. After August 9th, 2014, when Michael Brown was murdered by white power, I protested, I held signs, but then I went back to the normal, frustrating, cognitively disassociating routine. Even when faced with and beholding the awfulness that is the dystopian nightmare that we live in, in the pressure from white power to live and be a certain way, that continued to dictate my life. And I went along, I was complicit. So this is the living contradiction. On one hand, I saw with my own two eyes that there are two St. Louises. There are two Americas. And yet on the other, the bubble and cult that is American imperialism kept telling me again and again, save for retirement, keep up with Netflix, go camping and travel to Europe, have a gym membership, go out to brunch every Saturday and Sunday. It has led me as a way, this cult of white imperialism, it has led me as a way to escape this pain of feeling like an utter failure and the pain of seeing and feeling the horror of my own greed juxtaposed with seeing and knowing about the unimaginable pain of the non-white world and community. It led me to spend unimaginable hours pursuing various paths of escapism anything to drown out being present with the deep subconscious knowing of the horror that is white power in control of this world. And so the spiral of my depression began and it got deeper and deeper. Even though I had an outwardly good life, I felt hollow. My depression only deepened to the point where I became practically immobile and frozen. I was late to work every day, and if I wasn't at work, I was in bed, unable to get up. I had begun to actively contemplate and plan committing suicide. All this time, I yearned to be a part of something truly good, something greater than myself, something that was doing profound work in the world that I could fully unite behind. I had been a part of a smattering of organizations and meetings, but none of them felt truly fulfilling. But then, comrades, finally, <laughs> finally, on one fateful evening in November, I discovered the movement started by Chairman Omali Ishitela. who inspired an African woman, who inspired a white person from Dallas living in Boston, who then posted on Facebook an event called White Solidarity with Black Power. And one evening in November, I happened to see that post and I decided to show up, not knowing what to expect, but hoping for something great. And great it was, because when I walked through that old steel bars over windows, crumbling white paint door, <laughs> I saw my future USM St. Louis chair, my future drag brothers <laughs> sitting on the couch. And when I walked in, she popped up with a surprised smile and eagerly said, oh, are you here for the USM meeting? <laughs> was the night just five months ago that I was reborn, comrades. This movement has transformed me figuratively and literally. It has given me a path away from the awful cycle of depression and bound me to the most important cause of today, a cause that started 600 years ago. I never knew I could experience 
It's such a kind of joy and happiness. It is a new way of thinking. It is a new way of being that lives in direct contradiction to the self-devouring monster that is imperial colonial capitalism led by white power. And it has to end, comrades. It is ending. Every dollar reparated, every minute spent for the cause is a tiny cut, a strike to that monster. <laughs> Have there been many strikes? And this week and today, in just a few moments, we are going to deliver a mighty blow. We need 10,000 of those strikes today, comrades. We need to show our solidarity, not in just words, in words, but in the return of material resources that were and continue to be stolen from the African working class. Gone is the privileged wild goose chase that is white, extent, white existentialism, ex existentialism, because what has been made abundantly clear by the theory and practice of African internationalism and what I and what every white person knows and has known deeply in their heart is that until the revolution happens, every bit of happiness I feel and have ever felt and every con comfort I enjoy and have ever enjoyed has come and is coming at a terrible, unconscionable, heinous price. And it's been in my name and it's been in yours. My time, our time, is not our time. My knowledge, our knowledge, is not our knowledge. My money, our money, is not our money. It belongs to the African working class. It belongs to the Black Power Blueprint. It belongs to the African Revolution. I am white, I have benefited from and am benefiting from the white power and this imperial, colonial, parasitic, capitalistic system, and I owe reparations. All white people owe reparations. Let's make America pay reparations, 10,000 of them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and now for our final speaker, I would like to bring up Comrade Rowan. Uh -huh. Hello, my name is Rowan Long. I am participating in solidarity because of the generations of people with my skin color that colonized African people and stole their resources. I feel the responsibility to work toward giving back what was stolen. My lineage, lineage pillaged, enslaved, and killed people with a darker skin tone than their own. The way Africans w was treated was awful, and it is impossible to ever make up the damage we have done. Uh, do but we still should try to work towards giving back the resources we stole and we can still stand by them in their struggles. I feel an obligation to participate in the movement of black power. I believe that it is important not to organize the African people, but to follow their lead and stand with them in solidarity. The greed of colonization has led to the continued violence on African people. If we stand in solidarity, and pay reparations, we can hope to repay the damage white people have done to the Africans. This is why I stand in solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Yes! Uhuru, that was powerful. You are 11 years old? 12, just turned 12, happy birthday. <laughs> yes, that's powerful, that's a new generation. We have a responsibility to teach the younger white people that we need to you know, inherit this movement and build it and build a new world. So, let's get it going. I want to call up our basket passers, Carly and Hallie, and say that we are going to raise $10,000 today, so is there anyone that can just pay the full $10,000 and we can end this very quickly? 
And I take that very seriously because I know that white people have that in our bank accounts and in our communities. Or two people that want to do 5,000. Uh, is there anyone that can do 1,000? What about 500? We have one doing a five. Oh, can you please stand up and say your name? Ahuru, I'm Valerie. Ahuru, Valerie, 500. <laughs> and I saw another one in the DJ booth. Can you say your name? Lisa Watson. Lisa Watson, Ahuru for 500. 9,000 to go. And we have. Allie, doing 500, one of our calculators, Uhuru. 500 seems to be a popular number. And then is there anyone that can do 250? Uhuru, Ben, yes, Uhuru, Ben. Excellent, we have 250 from Ben. Anyone want to match Ben? Can you say your name, sir, for the live stream? <laughs> That's my dad, everybody. <laughs> Clyde Dewey Mackey Jr., just for the record. So thanks, Dad Uhuru. And um, one more for 250. Uhuru, can you state your name for the live stream? Mara Ratu. Mara Ratu, Uhuru, coordinating housing and transpo. Uhuru, thank you. Any more for 250? Oh my gosh, can you say your name, please? Run! <laughs> Excellent. And um, is there anyone that would like to match my contribution of $100? Oh, slow down. Oh, we have one for 200 from Chairwoman Penny Hess. Ahuru. <laughs> And can those, um, okay, so we have one over here. 150. 150 from our MC Mads, Ambrose, Uhuru. And then 100. 100. 100. 100. 100. Oh, I'm very self critical you weren't announced, but. Oh, uh, double sided sheets. They're such a pain. I should have done single side. I just wanted to save paper. As, um, but Janet Capron. Really appreciate you as Ella Baker at Level Sustainer and for contributing $100 today. Uhuru. And then we have another one. Uhuru. 200. Can you say your name for the live stream? Wendy Craig from San Diego. I saw another one. Uhuru. Gil Obler for 100. Uhuru. And then we have Uhuru Ruby Gittleson from Uhuru Furniture in Philadelphia. And then I see another hand. Do you want to state your name? Kitty Riley. Excellent. Uhuru 100 from Kitty Riley. Great, and just so you know, um, in case it is not obvious, um, when you're filling out your donor cards, which our amazing basket passers have been passing out, um, just be sure to write what level you would like to become. We're also gonna do a call for members or what amount that you'd like to contribute today. Um, so, and you can pay with, um, a check made out to Uhuru, you can pay with cash, or you can pay with a card, and Connor, the local treasurer of St. Louis um, USM, can help you at the back. So we wanna, if you are paying with a card, you want to go to the computer before you leave today to get those resources where they belong. And um, so there's several different ways. Um, you know, you can pay an amount, like I've been announcing, 200 
$150, or you can become a member, um, in which case an amount will be withdrawn from your account every month. I am proud to be a Marcus Garvey level sustainer at $60 a month. You can also upgrade your membership. So if you want to, if you're currently doing five and want to do um, $10 a month or $20 a month, that's also an option to contribute to our goal today, and that is deeply appreciated. Um, you can become a general member at $25 a month or 10, um, 25 a year or $10 a year for student or fixed income. Or you can make a one-time donation like many comrades have generously done today. Or you can do all of those things. Um, you can become a member and then immediately upgrade and make a donation. Um, and then uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, yeah, so like I said, the payment methods are cash, check, or um, on a card. And just make sure to go to Connor in the back to enter your information. And no matter what you do, please fill out the card. You know, as we saw, we do the give backs every year because we really, really appreciate everybody that gives resources to this movement. And I just want to say that um, we also have uh, $20 from CC Humans, the local St. Louis branch secretary, Uhuru. And um, $20 from Rose Latoul, Uhuru. Right, but we've de we're definitely at least at 3,600. So, oh, it's it's been up. It's been we're at higher. All right. Uhuru! So Jesse Neville, our amazing chair, is doing 150 and becoming Katura level carry sustainer. Katura carry level sustainer. Uhuru, I see a hand. Um, I'm also upgrading to elevate grade. Uhuru! Yeah. You're going to upgrade to Elevate because that's Ron and Wendy Craig. Shout out West Coast. Um, so we want to do, we want to give the opportunity for people to say whether they're becoming a member. It's very historic to become a member of USM. That's one less white person that white power can count on. So we want to go through the membership levels briefly. Um, they are listed on your card. So, and we are at 4,215. Uhuru. We have 50 from Stephanie Midler, Uhuru. Uh, and we're gonna go through the members and then acknowledge some people that weren't here today but wanted to pledge towards this $10,000 goal and see the Black Power Blueprint enter its next phase. So the first level that you can become a member at is um, Chairman Amalia Shetela. Um, amazing picture taken at the 7th Congress. And also the cover of Vanguard, so don't forget to get that book because you have your highlighter now, don't forget. Um, so you, that's $25,000 a year, $2,084 a month. Is there anyone that would like to become a Chairman O'Malley a sustainer of USM? All right, our next level. Our, ne our next level is our Kwame Nkrumah uh, membership level, which is 5,000 a year or 417 a month. Any would anyone like to become or upgrade to the Kwame Nkrumah level? All right, and then we also have the Harriet Tubman level at uh, 2,000 a year or 167 a month. And, um, oh, I want to announce that we have Kyle Bees at $100, Uhuru. <laughs> Um, the next level is the Ella Baker uh, membership, which a number of you have uh, generously upgraded to. Uh, that's once again at $100 a month or $1,200 a year. Is any, would anyone like to become an Ella Baker? Oh. I was last year and I think it's continuing, but I just want to confirm that I do want to, I'm doing $125, so I'll do $125 a month. Uh -huh. yeah. That is from Mara. And from Mara, Rat, Ratu? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. And then we have the um, Marcus Garvey level sustainer, which I'm proud to be one of those. Is there anyone that would like to become one or upgrade to that level? It's $2 a day, nothing. All right. Okay, next level would be the Fannie Lou Hamer, which is 40 a month or $480 a year. Anyone who would like to become a Fannie Lou Hamer membership? And then we also have um, 
a Malcolm X level sustainer, which was actually, we had a day of reparations to African people in Boston and that was the most popular sustainer level. It's $30 a month or uh, 360 a year, which is just a dollar a day. Is there anyone that would like to become a Malcolm X level sustainer or upgrade to that today? All right, oh, and we have another contribution from Micah Del Rosario for $20, hailing from Philadelphia. Yeah. Shout out, Philly. All right, our next level of sustaining membership would be the Katura Carey level of sustaining uh, at 25 a month or $300 a year. Would anyone like to become? Oh, we've got... Can you, can you, uh, we've got Rose Latoul, Uhuru, a new Katura Carey. Anyone else? Oh, Virginia Wilson. Uhuru. All right, Uhuru. Anyone else? Um, I think it was Pete Yaroshuk in Oakland that it was going to become a Katura Carey level sustainer as well. Uhuru. Uhuru. And oh, Janice Kant contributed fifty dollars. Uhuru. What? This says okay. There was a zero left off. Five hundred dollars from Janice Kant. Very different. Zeros are really important. Uhuru. Yes. Was it? Oh, was there only one zero left off? Okay. 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 Just making sure. Just making sure. Uhuru, 50 from Diane and 50 from Sandy Thompson. Right on. And the next level um, is Queen and Zynga, uh, 20 a month or 240 a year. I actually am upgrading from Queen and Zynga to Malcolm X. Uhuru, can you state your name for the live stream? Paula Lipsy, Uhuru, from Arizona. Okay, our next uh, level of sustaining membership would be the Huey P. Newton level, which is 15 a month, or 180 a year, which is two viewing subscriptions. If you want to give up Netflix and Hulu. All righty. I'm actually... Oh. I'm already on the chase. Um, oh, yes. All right. And Uhuru. Jesse Call would like to upgrade the membership to an Malcolm X. Uhuru! Jesse Call on security. And we have a new um, student level member, um, President Columbae at $10. Uhuru. Yeah. Or fixed income, yes, yeah, sorry. Right. <laughs> Um, Uhuru, so thank you so much, President Columbae, for joining USM, and... I'm gonna, I'm gonna upgrade to... Oh, we have an upgrade. To Huey P. Newton. Uhuru! <laughs> and then the next level is um, Che Guevara at $10 a month or 120 a year. Is there anyone that would like to be a Che Guevara level sustainer in the building? All right, take us home. All right, and finally, the introductory level sustaining membership, Steve um, Biko, um, at $5 a month, or $60 a year. Is there anyone here who would like to become a USM member at $5 a month? All right. And we also uh, got a new member in the form of David Lance, also has a fixed income at $10 a year, Huru, who just became the, uh, uh, thank all the people that could not be here today, but that pledged. Um, so we have, that they weren't named yet, um, we have Jessica Crawford, $10, um, Jake Scott, there's a couple, so you can, I'll wait till the end to clap, um, Jake Scott for 20 um, Colleen Beline, who is in St. Louis, who is renewing their sustainership for $25 a year. We have Janine Griswold, at tw uh, who wanted to contribute 25 to this goal. Je uh, Janae Iden, Iden, 
Janae Aiden, um, who is gonna do $25. Um, Annalise Schroeder is gonna, um, um, what's the word? Renew or renew or become a sustaining member at $30 a month, Malcolm X. We also have, oh, we have um, an amazing mother-daughter contribution right here with Raya Fogarty at $25 and her mom, Judy, at $25 as well. Hooroo. And I wanna just also thank Sam Day, um, who did $40, who designed the souvenir booklets. Um, Gregory Fister, who um, is a very beloved comrade here in USM St. Louis, who um, is away temporarily, but uh, has been instrumental in building USM St. Louis and did $40. Um, Susan Mortimer in Boston wanted to contribute $50. Rose Travis from Huntsville, $50. Uh, James White out in DC, $100. Allison Haney, the Secretary General of the African People's Solidarity Committee out in Philly, $100. We have Chick Byrne out in Boston for $100. Uh, Pete Yarshuk is doing $115. And Maureen Wagner for $250. Hru Maureen. <laughs> Um, is in the African People's Solidarity Committee and does amazing work in Uhuru Foods and Pies under the leadership of Deputy Chair, so shout out Maureen. And all these all these comrades I just listed, we just, if you're watching the live stream, really deeply appreciate your contribution and really wish that you could be here today. And we know that you are here today um, in spirit. I also want to thank uh, Connor Voss, who did $500 towards our goal. <laughs> and, um, do we have a total? And is there any more contributions online that I've missed? We have one from a new member in St. Louis, Dylan Voss for $50. Uhuru Dylan! We're at 6,960. That's really good. Almost at 7,000. 6,960. We have 100 from Anonymous, Uhuru Anonymous, which puts us at 7,060. From who? We have 100 from our amazing, okay, did everyone enjoy lunch? Yeah. Woo! That was, that meal took three months to make. We had an amazing food coordinator, Carly. Let's give a special salute to Carly, who is contributing $100 today, Uhuru. And there's lots more delicious food coming, so make sure to come, stay the rest of the evening and come back tomorrow. Uhuru, oh, we have $30 from Jackson Hollingsworth. Uhuru to our stage manager. We're at 7,240. Easy. Uhuru. Uh huh. No. Oh, we have, uh, but we salute you. <laughs> and we have um, 50 from Carrie Porter, Uhuru. <laughs> and just waiting for our, our calculators. Look at the, all those envelopes. They are hard at work over there. Okay, I see they're writing me a note. I don't know what's going on. I know that one likes to keep secrets from me. <laughs> we have Omalia Shatella, $120, Uhuru! Uhuru Chairman! Oh, yeah, you should ask. 
Do we do we have any more online donations? And if you are watching online, you can go to ahurusolidarity.org and you can choose either pay reparations or become a member. That is directed to you. I believe that is the camera way over there. Please please go online. Please please return. And I believe we're at 7,240. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh. Sorry. So I just want to give uh, a very huge Uhuru salute. We are over our goal. Mark Anderson for $5,000. Uhuru, unity through? Reparations! Uhuru, Uhuru. I just wanted to say one thing real quick. I just want to salute this amazing workshop and everybody who has contributed to this amazing goal today. And I want to really salute Mark Anderson. Uhuru to comrade Mark. Mark is a long time, powerful, profound supporter and example of reparations to African people and material solidarity with the African People's Socialist Party. And we, we love Mark, we salute you, we wish you could be here, but we know Mark Anderson is planning on coming to St. Louis in the next few months, so yeah. uhuru to comrade Mark. And Mark has also been an amazing guest on Reparations in Action, our radio show, bringing a very sharp and incisive analysis through African internationalism. So we just want to express our deep appreciation to Mark Anderson. Yes, he was there. He was right there in Oxford. Thank you, Deputy Chair. And that was one of the things that Mark summed up on the radio show was, you know, just the whole battleground of ideas that the chairman, you know, demolished when he was in Oxford. So we, will, we just want to give our deep revolutionary African internationalist salute to comrade Mark Anderson for his ongoing amazing example of reparations to African people. Uhuru. Uhuru. So we have one more, we have another pledge from Akile Anai for $60, Uhuru Director Akile. Is there something in from the, from the live stream? $10 to Evan Garner. $10 to Evan Garner, which puts our total at a nice even number of $12,500. Uhuru, yes, 12,000, okay. Now we gotta change the name of the workshop. Oh yeah, does anyone wanna do $500? Make it just... How dare you? So that puts us at 12,521 strikes against parasitic capitalism. <laughs> All right, do we have any more? Because this is, a, I mean, we're, we're not nearly as close to $14.2 trillion, which is owed to African people for the, st the value of stolen labor for chattel slavery alone, which does not include the terrors that African people face every single day. The murders, the vicious murders that we see of Africans turning up in gyms with their organs missing, of African girls going missing, being drowned. I mean, I mean, we need to celebrate this huge victory, but recognize that we have a lot more work to do, and that you know this money is going towards a new world where the murders of African people. It, w it won't be a daily reality. We're talking about African people being free and just the honor it is to be, have the capacity to know that our money is going towards that future. That is, I'm just, I'm so grateful I found this and I just really wanna salute that powerful statement from Ben earlier because, you know, and from Rowan, you know, I wish that I learned this when I was 12. We have $9 from Comrade Rowan, even numbers for the win. Twelve thousand five hundred thirty. Uhuru. That was that was a success. We did this together because we're socialists. So um, I really want to appreciate 
the basket passers, Connor at the back table signing people up. Um, please make sure, and Hallie as well, who's now joined the membership table to sign people up. This goal that we announced won't be real unless the resources actually go through, so make sure to visit the membership table. I also want to salute Allie and Amanda hard at work doing something I can't do, which is math. Even though my dad's an accountant, I just, that gene skipped, I suppose. Um, so I want to appreciate y'all, appreciate Ben and Rowan again, and of course, all the leaders at the African People's Socialist Party, Chairman Amalia Shetela, Chair Juan Penny Hess, and Chair Jesse Neville. And I just want to celebrate this amazing victory. There's one more level. Oh. Oh, ten dollars. Um, Jesse's going to put in nine more dollars, which puts us at um, twelve thousand five hundred forty. And oh. And I think, did we not announce the Steve Biko level? Oh, and I forgot that we have a new level. Um, it is the Luca Jonti level for if you contribute a diamond to, to become a liberated diamond through Black Star Industries, you can join at this level, and that is very important. We got, we had an amazing All Diamonds or Blood Diamonds tour where almost every stop, it was a 10 cities tour, where almost every stop someone returned a, di a blood diamond, because all diamonds are blood diamonds, um, because all resources are blood resources under the system where Africa is being looted and African people have no control of their resources. So if you, is there anyone that wants to contribute a liberated diamond who did not get a chance to at the All Diamonds or Blood Diamonds tour. My mom's. We have a mother of Ben Rosen's Waigahuru. <laughs> All right, so I just want to salute everybody again and. 10 to make it even, what, 250? <laughs> oh, so. It, 12,550 strikes against parasitic capitalism. Oh. Uh -huh. Make America pay. Reparation. Unity through. Reparation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, great go. workshop. All right. salute these comrades. I mean, those presentation was incredible. I cried. I was moved. And I just really unite with, you know, that story of finding the movement and how you wish that you found it. I think everyone says that. You wish you found the movement when you were 11 years old, you know, or 12, or, you know. Um, so I just really appreciate that uh, presentation and appreciate all of you all for contributing to reparations. And it's so funny, people are always like, well, come up to our table and be like, well, reparations, like, what is that gonna look like? This is what reparations looks like. So, <clears throat> uh -huh. And so next is a panel presentation discussion, uh, Stop America's Genocide Against African People. And I want to go ahead and call up our presenters one at a time. If you can come up when I call your name, I have the president of the International People's Democratic or Huru Movement, a revolutionary during the Ferguson Rebellion, and a member of the African People's Socialist Party National Central Committee, President Columbai and Annette. Uh -huh. Thank you, President Columbai and a, a member of the African People's Socialist Party and head of the Black Power Blueprint Economic Development Project in St. Louis, Missouri, T'Chara Masimba. Uh -huh. A member of the Black Power Blueprint National Steering Committee in the NTU Uhuru Volunteer Brigade sub Subcommittee, Abdullah Mohammed. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And the African National Women's Organization Arrest CPS Coordinator, Malika Alexander. Uhuru. And the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, Chair Jesse Neville. Uhuru. 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 Uhuru, everyone. Thank you, Comrade Mads. And I want to salute all of the amazing panelists and say what an honor it is to have all of you with us today at the Uhuru Solidarity Movement National Convention. 
And um, this is a panel called Stop America's Genocide Against African People. I just wanted to quickly introduce this panel by saying that we were inspired to hold this discussion in light of the campaign led by the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement that's called Africans Charged Genocide. And we have President Kalambayi and Danette, who will be speaking on that campaign. We're also joined, as was mentioned, by Tacharwa Masimba, who will be talking about the Black Power Blueprint, how the Black Power Blueprint is a fight back against the conditions of genocide imposed on African people, including through the prison system. We're going to hear from Malika Alexander on the work of the African National Women's Organization, especially to resist this entity called Child Protective Services that functions as an arm of genocide in kidnapping of African children from their families. And Abdullah Mohammed, who will be speaking on the work of the Uhura movement and with regards to the conditions inside the colonial prison system. So we're very, very honored to be able to have this program. And I just wanted to begin by saying that for those of us in the Uhura Solidarity Movement, white people under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, we feel it is extremely important to understand what it, we talk about when we say genocide and that the conditions of African people in this country as laid out in the powerful petition to the United Nations on the crime of genocide against African people in the United States of America that was published by Impedum, everything matches their definition of what constitutes a genocide, everything. And yet, as was pointed out by the chairman and, and laid out in the book Overturning the Culture of Violence by Chairwoman Penny Hess, the word genocide did not even exist in the English language until a sector, of, of, or any language, as the chairman said, and that the word did not exist until a sector of white people known as Jews in Europe experienced but a measure of what Europe as a whole, including Jews, had been inflicting on African people, on indigenous people, on Arab people, and the vast majority of the peoples on the planet Earth for hundreds of years. That it wasn't called genocide when white people stole this land from the indigenous people and carried out all of the horrific violence that was talked about in Chairwoman Penny's presentation earlier. The lynchings, so-called lynchings, the torture, sadistic murder and brutality against African people was not called genocide. That when Germany in the early 1900s went into Namibia and exterminated 90% of the Nama and Herero people of Namibia, Hitler was still in diapers. He had nothing to do with it. And there was no word for genocide when Germany carried that out. And there was no outcry from any sector of the European population inside Germany, including German Jews. There was no outcry. And everything that later came to be associated with so-called fascism and the Nazis, and which is the greatest evil in human history, we are taught, and the Nazi Holocaust, the worst crime committed against human beings by human beings, that everything that they did, that the Germans did to Jews, had already been done a hundred times worse to Africans on the continent, had been done. Hitler admired the United States, the settlers of the so-called West. He said, how, how did they exterminate the indigenous people with such efficiency? He admired that, and he aspired to that. And the only thing, the only difference is that he was doing it to white people. So that's why he became the greatest criminal in history. And the word genocide came into being to define that reality through the eyes of Europe, and actually to deny the real genocide that had been raging for hundreds of years against Africans and against colonized peoples. So that's something that we wanted to say, and I wanted to just read the definition of genocide that was published, that was put into international law governing the crime of genocide and human rights. In 1946, the General Assembly of the United Nations gave this definition of the crime of genocide. Genocide is a denial of the right of existence of entire human beings, as homicide is denial of the right to live of individual human beings. Such denial of the right of existence shocks the conscience of mankind, results in great losses to humanity in the form of cultural and other contributions represented by these human groups, and is contrary to moral law and to the spirit and aims of the United Nations. That's how they put it. Many instances of such crimes of genocide have occurred when racial, religious, political, and other groups have been destroyed entirely or in part. 
The punishment of the crime of genocide is a matter of international concern. The General Assembly therefore affirms that genocide is a crime under international law, which the civilized world condemns, and for the commission of which principals and accomplices, whether private individuals, public officials, or statesmen, and whether the crime is committed on religious, racial, political, or any other grounds are punishable invites the member states to enact the necessary legislation for the prevention and punishment of this crime. And below it says that genocide is defined as any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. A, killing members of the group. B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. We're gonna hear about that today. E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. We're gonna hear about that. Article three of the convention states, the following acts shall be punishable. Genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, and complicity in genocide. Which means not only is the US government guilty of genocide, all white people are guilty of genocide according to international law. And that is even more reason why we owe reparations and we have to build this movement of, under the leadership of the African working class for reparations to African people. So with that, I would like to Turn it over to our first panelist, President Kalambai and Annette Uhuru. Uhuru. I know not to touch this mic, but can it get lowered a little bit? Uhuru. I see the rules. Uhuru. As it has been stated, my name is Columbia Antoinette, and I'm the international president of the International People Democratic Uhuru Movement. And I just want to first appreciate my leadership, Chairman Amali Yeshatela. Um, and I want to recognize, you know, um, Deputy Chair Ona Zane Yeshatela and everything that she do. I just really want to salute her and every member of the African People's Socialist Party that's here and USM and everyone that made this event happen. I just want to salute and appreciate an amazing event. I mean, just from start to finish, everything that I have heard up to this point have been dynamic. So I just want to um, salute you. Uhuru. Um, you know, before I even say anything, I, um, as we was preparing for this panel or talking about this, I just really want to just really appreciate, um, you know, the science of African internationalists because without this theory, um, I would be just, I was completely lost and, you know, just trying to figure out what this reality that I experienced every single day of my life. Like, you know, we talk and we talking about genocide, but you know, African people experience genocide every single day, every second of the day, every second of the day. This is the reality um, of um, our life. And, you know, until I met the party, I didn't under I didn't even know, never heard of genocide, um, never heard of colonialism, um, and didn't know exactly how I was going to change this reality for my two beautiful daughters and my community. Um, and so, like Chairman says all the time, that you know, people without a dairy will just be everywhere. And so the thing that has been introduced to us is everything that imperialism offer African people, Christianity, all these religions, um, you know, TV, the reality that we see it from the posters, from everything, from you know, going into the doctor's office and seeing the magazine, everything um, that was being given to us did not ever help me see a way out. And so um, it struck me that I had a nephew and he, I went to go see him after he had got shot. And I said, I know this had to be a scary reality. And he said, it ain't as scary as waking up in the morning. And that's the reality of African people every day that, you know, it's more scary um, that I have to wake up and deal with this whole day over again as an African person. This is genocide that we experience. Um, so Africans George Genocide is a campaign that EPDOM, um, Chairman Amali Yeshatela brought to EPDOM right after Mike Brown died. And the party had did, you know, work um, way before I was even born and, you know, 
1982, I believe we had the first tribunal of reparations. And so Chairman had, you know, African short genocide, he said, we have to make genocide a household word. This has to be a word that every community, everywhere African people are, we have to understand the word genocide. And, you know, this is a revolution. It wasn't, this is not, um, an agenda to just get reparations from United Nations or anything like that. But we knew that African people have to understand this reality that we experience and be brought into political life. And so this whole campaign is to do just that. And it's a dynamic campaign that reached so many people. Just even online, we'll have over 10,000 people that have signed this petition with very little um, organization to push that petition, um, just being there people want to sign that petition. Um, and then, on, you know, paper petitions, you know, we have over 9,000 paper petitions from, out, you know, out in the community when this campaign first existed and all the different things that we have done. Um, and it was a criticism which, you know, I completely unite with that EPDM have to pick the ball up of African choice genocide and take this to the next level. We're not done yet. And so we are doing just that. So um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is where we at with African short genocide and where we plan to go. And this campaign is so critical and so important to build mass organizations. Um, and this is a working group. And so um, and this campaign is being led by, um, I'm acting like I'm, I can um, change the slide. Next slide. So um, I wanted, you know, this campaign is being led by um, EPDUM, and the chair of this campaign is Joshan um, out of San Diego that's leading this campaign. He's the chair of this campaign right now that sit on the IEC. Um, and we have been working on the POA and where we want to go with African shore genocide. So I just want to talk about some of the goals um, that we have um, for African shore genocide. So building the steering committee um, to, to capacity. So right now we have Joshan that is um, leading it. We have um, our secretary out of uh, Seattle, uh, Mar Marissa. Yeah, Marissa, um, out of Seattle, we have um, other forces, mass forces that are part of this um, steering committee as well. And we, I'm going to get to a slide to tell you and show you how you can um, be a part of African Shore Genocide and what we want to go with African Shore Genocide. Um, we want to gain one million um, signatures on this petition, and it's doable. Um, and this is, you know. What we talk about is the so you know cyberspace is not real. This is like street game, like street taking it to the streets, taking it into the communities, and literally, um, in we have um, organizers in 14 areas around the U.S. And if all of those organize, um, 14 areas um, go out and get um, 10 signatures a day. You know, in 2020, we can reach our goal. So it's doable, and we can do. And we have. We're gonna, you know, continue to build and have more people to do that as well. Um, having a speakers tour with President, with myself and other people of the movement. You know, we want to, you know, build um, events around African short genocide in particular area. It would be very powerful to put. St. Louis on trial. Let's just talk about the genocide that right here in this area where African people have experienced and things that happen here. In every place that African people are, we know that we can put them on trial and just really deepen people's understanding of the genocide, that what genocide means and what's the demand um, for genocide. So that speaking tour is going to be very important and we want to mobilize, you know, the speakers um, in our movement, you know, have Akile speak and, you know, uh, President yesterday and you know Chachara dynamic speakers all over wherever we are we want to bring them into this speaking tour and build a whole speaking tour um, around African short genocide of course this campaign is going to need um, it's going to take resources so these are just some bullet points that I wanted to bring out right now but we have 
you know, a whole, a whole bunch of um, goals and objectives for this campaign, but these are the ones that I really wanted to talk about is that we have today packets for you to be able to leave here today with African Shore Genocide petitions um, and, you know, just some club cards for you to start off, you know, going into your community and you can, you know, get those copies and make more copies of those um, flyers about African Shore Genocide and winning people to join the working group um, so we can build this uh, speaking tour in your area, um, to come in your area to talk about African short genocide. The next slide. Um, roles and responsibility of the African short genocide. So like I said, we have, you see the vacancies where we, um, we have um, Marissa that is active as the secretary right now, but that's a role that we really want to um, remove her from and put somebody else there. So that's, that's why it's vacant right now. But um, that's why I put a vacancy right there right now. And um, the volunteer um, coordinator, this is a very important, um, you know, role because you know, out of deputy chair office in Chachara, um, they have the NTU process. And so we see that African short genocide can really take on, you know, bring in volunteers in. And it's a strategy to build our mass organization, USM, um, EPDOM, the women's organization can take on this campaign and bring volunteers in for African short genocide and then recruit them into our organization. So African short genocide is a, is a way to bring the masses in under, you know, just fighting, you know, with genocide and then bringing them into African and nationalists, the theory and winning them to that and winning them to organization. Um, so uh, we have Yushindi as the outreach coordinator. You know, th the ground game is gonna be important. Um, Dexter is the info and ed. It has a lot of, you know, subtitles underneath that. Writers, we want writers from every area. We want these articles, um, people to be able to write um, about their experience so people can actually, because you hear genocide, but then, you know, I know it just in my own personal life, I can talk about the genocide that I experienced and to write that it help people to have a visual to see like an actual person and what, you know, African people experience on a day to day basis. So we want those, um, we want people to be able to write. Um, that's going to be really important um, to put things out in um, literature and the propaganda and social media constantly flooding um, the Facebook, any you know, um, place where we can put propaganda out, we want to be able to put that out, to have your sign saying African short genocide, how powerful is that? We see these whack signs that say, stop shooting, stop killing yourself, whatever they say, you know, but to have these signs in the yard would be very powerful, so propaganda and things like that um, is, you know, will be under Comrade Dexter. And so then we just talked about, um, can I have, is, can someone just give me water because I have like a real dry mouth, it's making it real, thank you. Um, and so, um, you know, we see this as a way, uh, thank you, we see this as a way, African Short Genocide Working Group, as a way to build all of our mass organizations. Because um, the theory of African and nationalists is one that mobilize and change lives. Like, I think all of us here are not the same people that we were when we met this movement. And so you might, was won by a personality, but the reason why you're here today is because of the political line. And that's so, so important. So a lot of times people um, will, we can we win people um, to this campaign around African short genocide, and then we start to like, you know, this whole campaign is led by a theory. And that theory helps people to, you know, unite with the political line to join organization. And that's super critical into changing the our whole community. And so we want to be able to take that on and we want all of our mass organizations to be part of this working group of African short genocide because it's a way to build all of our um, organizations. So I just put the vacancies of the different um, organizations um, to, you know, that can join, you know, the working group as well. So this just, you know, just break it down, um, you know, so it can be not so complicated. You can go to the next slide. I don't know what happened. Uh, okay, so um, just a little bit, you know, this is, um, we had the encampment tour, so when Chairman is so brilliant and he came and he said, 
the United Nation group um, of working of experts, I believe that's what they call African working experts um, for the United Nations were doing a tour. Um, and chairman said, you know, you know, do you think we have the capacity to do an encampment tour where, you know, we go to all these different places and we will go into the community because the poor working class don't know that the United Nation, we, Chairman was like, we know that they don't know that they're coming, but we're going to be out there to use this platform to win the people to understand that this is genocide and let them testify. He said, let them talk. And I was like, okay, you know, that sounds great, but I don't think I really wrapped my head around that we was actually about to sleep outside in tents in the cold. Um, I was just like fired up, like, yes, yes, chairman, it's brilliant. You know, like, whatever. I want to, you know, I want to make this revolution because I, I see the pain in um, the African community eyes every day, you know, going out into the community. So if that's what we need to do, let's do it. So we went um, to, you know, myself and other comrades. We went everywhere the United Nation was, and we had these tents, and um, we had a powerful political education. It was the political line that didn't make us just say, you know, pack up and just go back home and say, you know what, Chairman? And I think that, you know, it would have been like, okay, you know, it's freezing outside. I think my feet are frostbitten to go home. But that political line literally, like, not dreamy, but in a real sense, really helped us to continue to go forward and to continue to fight for it. And the more I went into those rooms and we testified and seen the petty bourgeoisie in full force, and it's like immediately when they seen us, they knew who we were and they despised the African working class. They did not want us to testify. They did not want us to say Africans chose genocide because all of them was in there trying to get a couple of cookies. A couple, you know, um, talking about, you know, um, how and programs, not calling it what it is, you know, just really slimy. And the more I went into those rooms and seeing that the African working class that was driving past, wondering why we outside in tents, that would stop and tell us these horrific stories, it was just very powerful. And we gained a lot of signatures on the encampment tour. Um, I think that when we got to the leg of New York, uh, where Deputy Chair even came, um, I think, uh, was that... Uh, Ruby? Man, Ruby fired, listen, okay? I go to the bush with Ruby any day, okay? The, the cops, before we even got there in Chicago, they told us don't go to New York. If you guys are planning to go to New York, they said that you better not go or you're, you're gonna get your head busted. Like, this is what one of the um, panelists tell us. And we're like, oh, we going? Like, you threaten us? So we went and we knew what we was up against. Deputy Chair Ruby uh, met us there. I think um, Chairwoman Penny Hess met us there. And Ali um, met us there. And the cops just circled around me. And Ruby was like, you better not touch her! <laughs> You know, like, you know, you better not, you like, hands off her. They, it was just really, really powerful. Um, and the people, we want the people to say, why are y'all, why do y'all have all these cops for these people with a microphone? Like, what, what are they doing so bad that, you know, you wouldn't allow them to stand here? And so they had it so on the tight that they would not let us find out. They, like, had it zip tight um, to let us know exactly where the um, working group was taking testimony. Testify, uh, testimonies at because they didn't want to hear us no more. Um, and then we got to DC where it was very powerful where African kid, we were out getting testimonies where this was happening at outside and why they in there, the bourgeoisie in there talking about, you know, what about just taking away African and we just one human race. This is what they testifying to this working group that made them experts at what, I don't know. And, um, Outside of that, it was a young kid that was being chased by the police and they had big guns and uh, we were out there and we were able to put, you know, win the people to come out of their businesses and look at the police and chant, and we was chanting fist up, fight back, you know, jail to kill a cop, and we were just chanting all these things, touch one, touch all, that the police had to let that little African kid go. And it was just really, really powerful um, to see things like that happen right before our eyes um, on this encampment tour. And you can see, catch all these things that I'm talking about on the African Choice Genocide um, 
Facebook page because we have clips of all these videos right there um, that you can see. Um, and then they didn't, they, at, after they took all these testimonies, they were going to read their final and um, their final results. And they didn't want us to be there either. And we had an inside scoop in DC. Yesterday was on it. And um, President Yesterday found out exactly where they were going to be taking these testimonies at. And we got in the room. And by this time, I know we was looking bad because we had been outside <laughs> sleeping in tents from city to city. You know, we ain't too fresh. We look like the peasants at this point. <laughs> and so they said we only could take two um, questions. That's it, after they read it. And um, they were, you know, saying all this crazy stuff. And they pointed to one of us. And that person, we had a strategy. We always have a strategy. That's why I love the Uhuru movement. We knew when we went in there, we had one spokesperson that was going to speak. So whoever they pointed at, Throw it to that. Throw it to Columbia. And I had already spoken with chairman and the whole central committee that we had a statement to be made. So it wasn't Columbia statement. It was the statement of the African working class because we was in a room, and we we don't be in this room, and we needed to be in that room. And it was you know African internationalists that equipped us um, to be able to speak our truth. Um, to speak for ourselves, and it was so powerful to be able to say, you know, what about genocide? I have heard you say all these different things, talking about, you know, housing and all these things, but all these things are it's genocide to African people, and they just and you can look at this on YouTube, and they just passed the mic, <laughs> and then finally one of them took it and said, yes. We um, heard you all the different places, and we taken that in consideration. That's why we having this conversation. And in that report, they say in that report that they recommend that America pay African people reparations. And that's the work of the African People's Socialist Party. So that's why it's on the lips of the Democrat Party, because of the work that organization do. One individual cannot do this. One in, it's not one individual cannot do this. It's not one heroic person that make up this organization. This work in the the theory of African nationalism and like Chairman said, we have to constantly duplicate ourselves because regardless of who get knocked off, the movement will continue to move all over whoever is in our way because we have a theory that help us to understand the world. And so I appreciate that. And then we you see the um, Flint, Michigan. Uh, we went into Flint, Michigan, and completely genocide. The people in Flint were more concerned about our petition than the water. They said celebrities have came here and did their pictures. Um, everybody have came here and dropped off water. But no one understands what they are doing to us. And you guys are coming with this petition for us to sign, to get organized, and that's way more than just simply water, a long-term solution. And this is the words of Flint, Michigan. And again, this is testimonies that we took and we recorded these testimonies on African shore genocide that you can listen to the people of Flint, Michigan talk for themselves when they say that they appreciate this petition because they understood this as genocide and they was happy to know that the rest of the world see what is happening to them. And we just let them know that this is what Africans experience in all over the world. So this is just some of the things that we did with African shore genocide and we have so much more to do with the speaking tour with you know going out doing the street games tabling African shores genocide knocking on doors doing all the work and winning people because we have to have that thousand members as Jesse um, have mentioned and he Pete um, um, you know very much you know is fighting for bringing um, Africans into um, political life and winning Africans to not only, and that's why I appreciate this because we never was under any thing of thinking that United Nations was in the arm of the state, but we use this platform to be able to reach 
our people to use this platform to, you know, for Africans to understand what it is to, you know, to put out African international. And so I just really appreciate the opportunity to serve the people in this way with African Short Genocide, which is a dynamic campaign that we are going to continue to build. And you will hear so much more um, in the, you know, the days to come, literally in the days to come, you will hear so much more around African Short Genocide. Uhuru. Thank you, President Colin Bai. Let's give another round of applause for that powerful statement. And it is, it's africanschargegenocide.org, right? Yes. Okay, so sign the petition if you haven't. Go to africanschargegenocide.org, and the Uhuru Solidarity Movement will be involved in building this campaign. And that's one of the things we want to get, you know, we want to win out of this, this panel is, is the commitment from the organization to be part of this campaign, be part of the speaking tour, build it, and win white people to sign this petition. So, Uhuru. And now I would like to introduce from the Black Power Blueprint National Steering Committee to Charwa Masimba. Uhuru. <laughs> Um, just the uh, USM and uh, the leadership, but um, I want to start off by just recognizing Chairman Omali Yeshitela and a nice PowerPoint I put together on his behalf. Um, yeah, and I'll say more um, about um, our leadership, you know, but um, I'll just say in short, we've been hearing people talk about uh, the work that the chairman has done and African internationalism and the necessity for theory. And um, I think that, you know, we cannot overstate the contribution that uh, the chairman has given the whole African liberation struggle and the struggle of all oppressed people around the world through providing a theory that we refer to as African internationalism. And the theory is not something that just, uh, you know, falls out of the sky. It's not something that you can just uh, think real hard about and come up with and then come, with good, come to good conclusions, a theory is something that um, is born through actual struggle. And so, you know, people are in a, engaged in a struggle to solve problems in their actual lives. And uh, through that process, they begin to uh, observe uh, events in reality to make generalizations about those observations, sum them up, and uh, in the process, begin to uh, get a better, more accurate picture of the way that the world really works. And uh, the chairman has engaged in this process in such a way that it is correct that he is the greatest theorist, revolutionary theorist of our time. And he has given us, uh, through African internationalism, a science. Yeah so that we don't have to rely on speculation, we don't have to rely on um, good ideas that we uh, believe or feel about the way that the world works. We have a way of testing the world to see how accurate it is. And um, I think that is um, you know, something that will live long past uh, the Chairman Omali Yeshitela himself, and that's African internationalism. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I also want to recognize my direct leadership, whose picture should be coming up shortly, um, Deputy Chair Ona Zene Yeshitela. And you will hear us say a lot in this movement that the economic and the political are one. And uh, we see the chairman as the embodiment of the political. And in so many ways, Deputy Chair uh, represents, in a real significant way, the practical economic work that gives life to African internationalism and the uh, building that we sit in and all of the forces under her leadership are a di direct testament to that. So I want to recognize deputy owners and I guess to tell as well. And um, of the African People's Solidarity Committee, uh, Chairwoman Penny Hess, you know, for her long uh, struggle 
joining uh, the and founding the African People's Socialist Party under the leadership of becoming the founding chairperson of the African People's Socialist Solidarity Committee under the leadership of the party in what, 1976? 1976, uh, old, longer than I am old. So we want to recognize your struggle and your long commitment. I want to recognize uh, Jesse Neville, who is the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. I don't have to have the PowerPoint that's not working. Um, so I wanted to, you know, we, we were talking about genocide, and I really <laughs> wanted to uh, talk about the, I'm here to talk about the Black Power Blueprint, but I wanted to talk about um, the Black Power Blueprint as a force of uh, dual and contending power, which is a concept that uh, the chairman introduced to the black liberation struggle in 1977, I believe. And in fact, um, it's been 42 years almost to the date. It was April, uh, I think 14th, 15th, or 16th of 1977 that he presented this to a black organizers conference. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what that means and how the Black Power Blueprint represents dual and contending power. Um, this concept developed, like we said about African internationalism and theory in general, it is something that doesn't just fall from the sky. It's not just an idea that people come up with um, because they had a good idea, but it was developed through actual struggle. Um, and then I wanted to read also this from uh, tactic and strategy, um, I'm forgetting the title of it. It was a paper, what is the title? It's tactic and strategy of the black liberation um, presented by the chairman at that conference. He says under the title, creating dual power, but there are other strategical objectives our movement must keep in mind while doing political work, including building mass movements. One of these objectives must be the creation of dual or competing or contending governmental powers. That is to say, to the degree possible, our movement must assume the real and put actual responsibilities of the government for our, of government for our people. This cannot be done by proclamation, but must be done over a period of time as the people develop confidence in us through actual practice. Um, so what is dual and contending governmental power? It is a uh, contending structure, which we see the Black Power Blueprint as one example of. It is a structure that is designed to give the people direct participation in the process of governing themselves. It is a structure that is designed to address <laughs> the people's need to feed, clothe, and house themselves. And ultimately, it is a structure designed to contend with the ruling class for direct power. And while it may seem obvious uh, to do such a thing, it was born out of this real struggle uh, to understand the role of all of the mechanisms of power and how a revolutionary struggle should um, engage those, uh, those institutions. And so we see in the early 1900s when the Garvey movement is building all over the world with up to 11 million Africans uh, under the slogan, Africa for Africans, those at home and those abroad. This is born uh, in an age where you see imperial powers fighting with each other over uh, the possession of certain colon colonial territories, over the possession of the land and resources of Africa, uh, the people of the so-called Americas, the people of Asia, you see this struggle uh, for empire building uh, in a way that the imperialists are in a struggle with each other at this, at this point. You see the Berlin Conference shortly before that, 1884, 1885, uh, they, Europeans come together at a table in Berlin, Germany. Uh, they carve up Africa. Um, so you have the development of these, and the chairman talked about this earlier, uh, socialists in Europe who are themselves contending with these forces, but they have one set of problems that they're trying to solve, and the problems that they're, not, they're trying to solve do not require, uh, do not speak to African people struggling to get freedom. 
Uh, they are mostly concerned with white workers who sit, as the chairman said, on top of the pedestal of the oppression of all African indigenous and indigenous people all over the world. Uh, but they want to solve the problem for white workers. Um, and they often refer to them as industrial workers. They may not call them white workers, but this, this is who, who they are talking about. So this is happening at a time uh, for white workers. They begin, some of the socialists begin to recognize that the uh, European state is uh, taking on a more repressive form for white workers at this time. And they are recognizing uh, also that some of the socialists are beginning to uh, capitulate to uh, the imperialist powers. And they began to support the imperial wars in the name of a uh, country or a, a kind of white nationalism. And so as the socialists are uh, looking for a way to seize power for white workers, they see these uh, contradictions happening. And so there develops this whole struggle around defining imperialism, which uh, the chairman laid it out um, via Lenin. This incredible Russian revolutionary, he said that uh, capitalism, uh, he said that imperialism was the highest stage of capitalism, meaning if capitalism came first, it developed into imperialism because they recognize, they are now recognizing how imperialism is affecting white workers. But the fact is, imperialism was born through, it was born in the process of slavery and colonialism. So Lenin thought that imperialism was defined by a consolidation of what he called finance capital. Uh, but through African internationalism, through the work directly of the chairman in this party, the, we understand that the real consolidation uh, giving us imperialism was really the consolidation of the European identity, where white people who were form, once warring tribes began to consolidate themselves into one entity uh, referred to as white or European. And so this is empire. It preceded capitalism. It gives birth to capitalism. But they see imperialism now uh, as the fundamental feature because it, it is affecting them in a certain kind of way. Um, so they want to know how to capture power and how to resolve these contradictions in the process. And V.I. Lenin, who is uh, known for coining this term uh, dual and contending power, um, he initially. Okay. Uh, I don't know that. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, dual power, yeah. and we'll learn where the contending is that. Okay. So he coined the term dual power. Right. And, um, but initially, he didn't, uh, he didn't understand uh, the potential for this structure. And he didn't, you know, he didn't have a notion of it at first. Uh, because the Soviets that he referred to as dual power began to, you know, they, they developed almost spontaneously in 1905 in Russia uh, during that struggle, and he didn't recognize them as dual, dual power initially. Uh, but he began to, con you know, in the process of writing and participating in struggle, uh, he began to look at the 1871 Paris Commune and look at that commune and begin to recognize that that is similar to the Soviets and that it is necessary uh, to utilize this force outside of the typical uh, parliamentary process. So you cannot just simply use the government um, and rely on moving people into government positions to become a majority. You cannot simply rely on the trade unions, uh, but you have to build a structure that can contend directly with the state uh, with the goal of smashing the state. And you know he goes back and uh, quotes Marx who says that the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machine and wield it for its own purposes. Um, because they recognize that the parliament, they, to go back a little bit, they, uh, they thought that capitalism was progressive. Um, coming out of an era of feudalism where the vast majority of the people were not slaves, but the next closest thing to it, to them, capitalism was something progressive. And they 
uh, believed that they had to first usher in a bourgeois capitalist democracy before they can move to socialism. So they were aiming for that initially. And in the process, they wanted to utilize parliament, uh, put people into parliament, and that became one of the primary means by which that they would come to power. They wanted to use trade unions and stuff. Uh, but being, began to recognize uh, that imperialism was making that impossible for them and that the trade unions became um, a process by which the bourgeoisie took control, white workers would be utilized uh, really to forward imperialism and not in the interest of white workers. So they developed these structures, or they really began to understand these structures that became necessary. Um, and my time is up. So. Let me wrap this up really quick. Quickly, um, we recognize, you know, through our own process as well, that um, you know, imperialism was born through slavery and colonialism, and that it, it is something that we have to we have to build dual and contending power structures to contend with white power in every field. So we believe in going into the electoral arena and uh, bringing revolutionaries into the electoral arena. We believe in using all forms of struggle and the Black Power Blueprint is seen as a dual and contending structure that allows us to begin to feed, clothe, and house ourselves to win masses of the people to this project and allow us to contend directly with white power for actual control of our own lives. Uhuru. Thank you to Charo Masimba. Huru. All right, thank you for that excellent presentation on the theory of African internationalism. And, you know, I love the theory of African internationalism, and I really appreciate, you know, the way Tacharo just laid that out. So, um, and we will have Q&A, so hopefully everyone will have more time to, you know, add on to anything that you might have not had time to cover. Um, so now I would like to bring up, it's an honor to introduce of the Black Power Blueprint National Steering Committee, Abdullah Muhammad. Uhura. Uhuru, comrades. Uhura. It is an absolute honor and pleasure to be here before you to speak to you. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the chairman, Amali Yeshatela, you know, for his dynamic theory, uh, his hard work and efforts, you know, in the reformation of our community to save us and to give us a theory that would get us out of this situation that we're in. And I thought that uh, analogy of a radar, a plane without a radar was very telling uh, that the brother Barron gave, you know. So we need direction. We need a compass. We need a guidance. And so this brother, uh, Amali, Chairman Amali, is a supreme captain. And I, you know, I'm going to follow his guidance because it's sure guidance. And you can see the result. You can see the, the result of his work, the result of his efforts. And I would like to thank the co-chairman or the deputy chairman. Ona Yeshatela, Ona Yeshatela, for her hard work without uh, whose uh, presence, without whose efforts, we wouldn't even be here. Then I would like to thank Penny Hess. You know, for being here, for her hard work in uh, convincing white people that they owe a debt to us and showing it in a truthful way, showing them in a way that they could not deny it. Then I would like to thank Jesse Neville, you know, for his hard work and his sincerity and his dedication, you know, to bring reparations to the black community to try to restore us for what was taken from us. So I just, and then I like to thank my direct leadership, Tachara Masimba. You know, he's, you know, trying to make me into a steel cadre. And, uh, you know, I'm doing my best. As I told the brother, when I told him what I was going to do, I said, man, I'm qualified to speak on mass incarceration. I was incarcerated all these years. I don't need to study it. I, I don't know it. I lived it. He said, brother, you better study these manuals and stuff. <laughs> so with that being said, I want to go from the African people's uh, working platform I want you to know what we standing on in terms of mass incarceration. So we want the immediate and unconditional release. The immediate and unconditional release. We don't want no conditions placed on it. We want the immediate and unconditional release of all black people who are presently locked down in U.S. prisons. Why do we want it? 
Why is this our stance? Why do we want that? Even though we know if you, even some of us would be afraid, don't unleash them criminals back into the society. They're going to kill us. They ain't going to kill us. They ain't going to kill us. And I will tell you why they're not going to kill us. We believe that all the African men and women who are locked down in U.S. concentration camps, commonly known as prisons, are there due to decisions, laws, and circumstances which were created by aliens and foreigners for their own benefit and as a means of genocidal colonialist control. Just even the Bible was used against us to vilify us, to demonize us, said that we were the cursed children of Canaan, of, of Ham. Canaan is the cursed children of Ham. So then they make it God out to be some unjust entity. If Ham is the one who looked on Noah's nakedness, his father's nakedness, why would you curse his, uh, curse his son? That God is unjust. So, but he said that he would be a hue of water, a hue of, of, of wood in a drawer of water, right? So that don't make no sense, right? But this is what they talk to. So this is justified, you know, te uh, treating black folks in a different, well, they cursed by God. God cursed them. So we can kill them. We can mistreat them. We can misuse them. And then in, in the Bible, it's telling the children of Israel, kill the Gergesites, kill the Hittites, kill the Jebusites, all of them. The men, the women, and the children, even they cattle. So this is why a Christian could kill and murder without any qualms or, or reservations. Because he think he's doing the work of God. But it's not the work of God. It's the work of human beings that's using these theories, using this Bible to justify their brutality to humanity. So this is why we want the unconditional release. We believe that these decisions, laws, and circumstances was created and are forced without our consent. We don't have no consent. We don't have no say-so in these prisons and jails and how they being run, right? Lord, have mercy. <laughs> we believe that these decisions, thank you, sister. We believe that these decisions, laws, and circumstances are created and are enforced without our consent and are therefore illegitimate. We believe that the African men, women, and children, we believe that the African men and women who are locked down in these concentration camps are victims of U.S. colonialist ruling class justice, which maintains our enslavement and terrorizes our people, and that they should therefore be released immediately to the just representatives of our struggle for liberation, independence, and socialist democracy. Who are these just representatives? The African People's Socialist Party. We're the ones that are trying to get ready for them to come home. We're the ones trying to train them to, to, to love themselves again. See, we was taught to hate ourselves. We was taught to hate ourselves. If you watch Tarzan, you'll see Negroes rooting for Tarzan against the Africans because we was taught to hate the Africans because they was depicted as demeaning, low life, silly, dumb, stupid, right? This is how they was depicted. So you grow up watching this. And so you develop this, this uh, hatred for yourself or a hatred for Africa, a hatred for Africans. And so you would nullify yourself. You would nullify those who look like you. You would kill them with, with no qualms. Right. But when we're in the 60s, when we came with this black glove, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, and we start wearing our own hair again. We start wearing dashikis. We start wearing the afro. We start saluting each other. Black power. They made the United States government made a conscious decision to destroy that movement yeah. because they wanted to destroy you. They wanted to destroy us. They wanted to destroy our minds. And how do you do that? I'm going to come with a movie glorifying drug dealing. I'm going to come with a movie glorifying pimping. I'm going to tell them, you was a pimp. That's what you really are. You're a drug dealer. That's what you really are. And so then I'm going to take out the legitimate means of sustaining yourself. I'm going to make it where you unemployed and unemployable because I'm going to give you two, three, four strikes and you out. I'm going to give you a criminal record so that you are qualified to get these jobs. Right? So it's, it's, it's a dialectic that's being done. It's a decision. It's a plan. It's a scheme. And it's by design. But if you don't know this, if you haven't been taught this, you say, look at, look at them. Look at how evil they are. Look how they're killing themselves. Look how dirty and nasty they acted. Right? But look at what was done to us. Yes. You can't blame Frankenstein for being a monster. Well, you got to go get Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> oh. 
No niggas existed before they were brought here and made into niggas. Yeah. Wasn't no niggas. We weren't calling each other nigga in Africa. Yeah. We weren't hating our hairstyle. Yeah. We said, oh, beautiful sister, you so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I love you. But you come over here, you black and ugly. Your lips is ugly, your nose is ugly. And so we internalized this. So this is something that was done to us. So how do we get out of this situation? How do we turn this around through the theory of African internationalism? Yes. Through learning what was done to us, how it was done to us. Then only knowing what was done to you will give you the, the ideal or the knowledge on how to get out of that situation. That's right. That's what we on. See that? See, Malcolm told us the truth. He said, you can't get drugs up in Harlem without the white man's permission. Yeah. You can't get alcohol or gambling or prostitution or none of this without the white man's permission. Right? right? He brought these drugs, and our freeway Ricky told us what happened. The CIA brought him tons of drugs. Yeah. Tons of drugs. He'd go out. Go out. Destroy yourself. Destroy your community. and say that, but that's what they wanted him to do. Turn prostitutes into your women. Turn where they, 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 they hunger for this crack. They'll do anything for it. So this demoralizes the community. This, 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 this destroys the fabric of our society, right? So now we look and we using each other, we mean each other, and we treating each other all type of ways, and we killing each other, and they giving us the guns to kill each other with. They giving us the drugs to destroy each other with, right? But they not giving us any knowledge. They not giving us a scientific theory, right? Omali Yeshua telling African People's Socialist Party is giving us the knowledge, it's giving us the theory. This is why we have to promote it. He's following the teachings of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, who said, up, you mighty nation, you can accomplish what you will. Get up, stand up. You're a human being, and I'm going to show you what you can accomplish with your mind, with your intellect. He established an organization of 11 million strong. This is showing what the African can do. This is showing the potential of the African. He said, we have to take back our gold mines. We have to take back our rubber mines. We have to take back that which belongs to us. Our gold mines, all this stuff that was taken from us. So I, this is why I appreciate so much uh, the Solidarity Committee, the Huru uh, Movement. Because you realize your stake in this. You realize what you have to do to bring this situation under, to, under control. You have to do the right thing. You have to do the just thing. And the right thing is to fight against imperialism. The right thing is to fight against colonialism and neocolonialism. We have to call these people out. We got to call these Uncle Toms out. We got to call these Thomasinas out. We got to call these white handkerchief head wearing niggas out. We got to set them out. Yeah. We got to do it. Because if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. Right. If not us, who? Who? So look, Vanguard up. Vanguard up. It's way less food. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love you. I love you being here. I love the chairman. I love his beautiful wife. I love my beautiful wife, uh, wife Malika Alexander. I spent 27 and a half years in prison for an armed robbery. Didn't kill nobody. Armed robbery. The police was after me. I shot at them. I ain't gonna lie. You tell Merkel, they was shooting at me, right? I was out doing some expropriations, you know? Just trying to get my reparations. You know what I'm saying? This is what you owe me. All this money you got in the U.S. banks, that's my money. Oh, that's our money. But see, I was thinking that's my money. But that's our money. So I want to thank you for helping us to get our money. I, I really appreciate you. It's really heartfelt. You know, I love these white people. You know what I'm saying? Because when I, when I when, look, when I last white folks I robbed, I said, let me get the white folks money. And the sister that was there behind the teller, she told him that's what I said. He said, give me the white folk money. <laughs> she didn't identify with me. <laughs> she identified with them. To me, to her, I was a robber. I was a villain. You see the work we got ahead of us? See, it's, it's knowledge. Knowledge is what makes a person, I don't want to say superior, but able to do the work that he has to do. 
Without knowledge, you can't do nothing. An ignorant person can't do nothing. You know, one learned person is more powerful than a thousand ignorant folk. One hour of studying is better than praying all night. Yes. Your situation ain't going to change. Oh, master, come down and help us right now. If he was going to come down and help you, you wouldn't be in the situation that you're in. You got to help yourself. God helps those who help themselves. So let's help ourselves. Uhuru. Uhuru. Wow, that was amazing. Isn't this an amazing panel that we have here? Uhuru. Prison walls must come down. Uhuru. I want to appreciate that great presentation, and I wanted to mention, actually, one of the things that, in addition to the Africans Charged Genocide campaign, one of the things that inspired this panel was um, we had a Black Power Blueprint web event that Chairwoman Penny hosted, which featured as guest speakers to Charo Masimba, as well as Abdullah Muhammad and Malika Alexander, and it was very powerful. And we were watching from St. Pete, and it was just obvious after that that event that we had to do this panel at the USM National Convention. So I'm glad we did. This has been incredible. And last but not, certainly not least, it is my great honor to introduce the final panelist on this incredible uh, panel that we've had today, which is of the Na African National Women's Organization. Please join me in welcoming Malika Alexander. <laughs> I am so glad to be here. First of all, I need to like salute my man right there because he did that. <laughs> and then I want to salute our leadership. Um, I want to tell you a little about a bit about how I came to the movement. I've always been about empowering people, but I always wondered why it would be to the end of we didn't keep it going, or we get to a certain place and it stopped. And when we started studying the theory of African internationalism, then I realized it was because the people that I was joined with were joined in with the people that we were trying to fight. And they didn't want to mess up their stuff, so we could only go so far. So when we came into the movement then, as um, I sat and I got to talk to chair, uh, DC chair, and she pointed me to AMWO. Changed my life. Changed my life. I, I, I always knew that I had power as a black woman. I always, I always knew that I had a voice as a black woman. I've always been what my mom would deem revolutionary, but they told me it was out of place. Because, you know, no, I was a church girl. My daddy was a pastor, my mama was a pastor, my, husband, my first husband was a pastor, so that's where I grew up. So everything that I felt was out of place yeah. until now, yeah, right. until now. And so AMWO is the African National Women's Organization, and we're the only mass gender-specific organization of the African People's Social yeah. Party, right and we are bad. Yeah. <laughs> Our leadership is bad, and the women that are in the organization are bad, and we ain't scared, yeah. okay? And so um, we're poised to take on all of the struggles of the African working class woman. And how can we do that? Because I am one. I know about that. I know how to fight that. I know what it was like to get divorced after 25 years and have two kids, and you ain't never had a job. And so you got to figure out how you work out to do, but I knew I wasn't going to let them take my kids. Yeah. I knew that. So, okay, enough about me. <laughs> um, the AMWO has several campaigns that we deal with, um, prison outreach, and I know a little bit about that, you know, um, having stood by my husband for at least 12 years of inc his incarceration and just being there and just, that's what awakened the fight in me to say, you have to stand. Yeah. 
because I saw how they wanted to treat us. I saw how they wanted to tear our family apart and how they wanted to, to demoralize him, emasculate him. And so I made it my business to let them know, uh-uh, you're not, not, no, you're not going to do that with me. Right. Not me. And so I went in as the lady associated with M14212. That was his number. And that's what they would call me. Oh, she's here for N14212. No, I'm here for Jeffrey Alexander. He got a name. And so, but by the time we left there, I was M142, M14212, but when I left, we were Mrs. Alexander. Yes. Yes. Mrs. Alexander. Yes. <laughs> and the other campaign that I want to talk specifically about is the Arrest CPS campaign, and that is for women that have or are in danger of losing their children to Child Protective Services. It is a fight for African child welfare. I know people say, oh, well, if we put them in a different place, then they'll thrive and they'll grow and they'll do this and they'll do that. No. No. You can't, why do, why we, do, why do we use the word kidnap? Because kidnapping is when you take somebody out of something that they are used to and accustomed to and, out, and put them in a whole situation that's totally different, totally nobody looks like them, nobody acts like them, nobody does, you want, just want to totally indoctrinate them. And then you wonder why they act out, why they do this or they do that or everything like that. That's what this campaign is about. <coughs> the goals of Arrest CPS are to expose the parasitic nation, nature of the foster care system and the devastating role it plays on the lives of black families. I cannot tell you how many women reach out to us and are telling us about their situations and that they have either lost their children or they're in danger of losing their children and there's nothing they can do. They feel helpless. They feel hopeless. And the children are frightened beyond measure. Nobody deserves to live like that. We're exposing genocide, the intentional action to destroy a people in whole or in part, intentional. You know when you break these families up, then there's no more hope for the black family if they're spread all over everywhere, right? right? Yeah. There's nobody t to teach those black children the pride that they need to have in being who they are. There's nobody to teach them, our young men, how to grow into be, be men. And all they get to hear is the stories about, you know, what my husband was just talking about, you know, oh, they're just killing each other, this and that. They get a, a misconstrued conception of who they are and why things are that way. We want to put an end to that. We want to expose that. We're raising the issues of state-sponsored kidnapping. We're talking about what, what is it that actually goes on that allows them to be able to do this? Because According to the statistics that they put out, it's legal. They can do it. It's on the books that they can do it. But if we are able to expose this, black children are disproportionately represented in foster care system in the United States, and most children are removed based on cultural bias that are associated with living on or below the poverty line. They get being penalized for being poor. Is that fair? Is that fair? No. No. Black parents are fighting court for years to regain custody, but continue to face barriers from the court as their ch children age out. They go through years and years and years of trying to fight to get their children back, and soon the kids are 18, and they've aged out of the system. Now, they don't care what they, where they go now. Now they're going to the penitentiary. 
When the state kidnaps black children, the black family is irreparably damaged. I cannot tell you how that felt when they were talking about my kids. I couldn't imagine being without my kids. I couldn't imagine them placing somebody else, placing my kids with somebody else. I couldn't imagine that. I can't imagine that now and they're grown. And I, so I can't walk down the street and see a black mother, a young black girl struggling with her kids and not feel nothing. And for the, my black sisters that say they can do that because they're educated, I said, girl, you better get in touch with yourself. Yes. Right. You know, I said I, was, I came up in the Bible Belt, you know, and so, um, Chairman, I was listening to uh, one of your studies about Jesus being a revolutionary. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, now I got some stuff to fight with. <laughs> but I thought about that, that scripture that said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And I made you what you are. So when I thought about that, then I thought the first thing that God made me before he called me Malika or anything else was he made me a black woman. Yeah. So that means, okay, if I'm not in this fight, then I ain't fulfilling my purpose as what God made me to be. Okay, if you want church, there it is. <laughs> With little or no evidence, black parents are criminalized and isolated. No place is exempt. And all this is, the next couple of slides are just talking about different places, like the next slide, Austin, Texas, where um, those children are five or six times more likely to be, be removed from their homes than white children. Next slide. This mother right here, she, um, her children were taken out of her home because of something that happened at school. Next slide. This mother right here is another mo mother. She's um, in Philly, and same thing, she lost her, her children because she came up against the school system. And they went in and took her children while she was not at home. Oh. Wow. Calling C CPS or DHS is one of the tools that they use to make parents comply. And that's all they want you to do is comply. This is a rally that we held in Philly dealing with this issue. I'm going real fast. Baltimore. So this fight is not new. And we did learn some things from these situations. We learned how, learned how to fight smarter. We learn how to, as, as um, the chairman teaches us all the time, we learn how to organize better. We learn how to study our opponent more. I call it infiltrate. You know, I, I grew up in the bourgeois system, so I ain't got no problem with putting on a suit and going down to the courthouse to see what's going on. I want to infiltrate. I want to see what you're doing. I want to I want to know what makes your system tick. So then I can take it back and I can say, no, this is what we're dealing with. No, this is what we need to come against. That's just a video. And that just goes into what I said about what we've learned. Most of these parents, the primary need for them is not having the resources to be able to fight their cases. They, so when, the, when CPS comes in and takes their children, then most of them do not have, they don't have the knowledge or the money to be able to fight their cases. And so most of the time when the kids are gone, they're gone. I told the story before about one sister that her name was Crystal. And when I talked to her, I thought her, her situation was new because that's how fresh it was when she started talking. But as she talked more, I found out that this was 20 years in the making. Yeah. And she's still on medication. Yeah. She still can't go out in public. I couldn't even talk to her on the phone. We had to um, do it on the keyboard, on the computer, because she would get so upset. This happened 20 years ago. Yeah. 
but she's still affected by that now. We're overturning our own contradictions. It's not like we don't know what goes on in our community. It's not like we don't know that we need to train and educate. It's not like we don't know, we don't know that we need to organize, we need to build, we need to, that's where uh, we have the uh, Uhuru Kijiji Collective that we're working on. That's supposed to come out of this. We realize that we have to do some other things, right? Our current campaign goals is we're building a national steering committee and we're trying to get people involved and we've come up with a Know Your Rights card that we actually distribute as we go out to do um, out things on the ground where we can tell parents, this is what you can do. You know how they have those, uh, those things that they tell you when, you, when the police stop you, yeah. then you can do this? Well, that's what that is. Yeah. When, when CPS come to your door, yeah. this tells you what, what you can say, yeah. what, you can, what you can do, what you don't have to do, what you don't have to look, because they will have you think that just because they came with the bats and said they the state, that they run everything. Uh-uh. So we're trying to educate. How can you help? We need to connect with attorneys, and parents need proper rep representation in court. They need fearless attorneys who know the law and will advocate fiercely for the rights of the parent and the child. Yes. We need lawyers who can volunteer their services and give advice, review court documents, protect against state re retaliation, represent black mothers and fathers who are who are really justly trying to re regain their children, custody of their children, by demanding reparations. <laughs> We're establishing a fund for these families. In addition to raising this as a political question, ANWO has the intention to establish a fund that will allow us to help families navigate the treachery of the state. That is so that when they come to us, then we have money in, in our coffers where we can say, okay, oh, what do you need? Okay, we can help you with that. We want to have um, lawyers that we're connected with that we can pick up the phone and call and say, this is what we're dealing right, with right now. I'm getting ready to shoot you some documents. Can you look at that? Tell me what that's about. This is by no means all of what we're trying to do. We're doing this in phases. This is where we begin. And this gives us the liberty to be able to start to, with the women that we already have that have contacted us and to be able to move out and establish some things to get their, get their stories out there, to mobilize our troops. Uh -huh. <laughs> Give it up for the amazing panel, Guru, all of our panelists. Guru. Well, I just want to say what an incredible honor it has been to host this panel at the USM National Convention, and all of the statements and presentations were incredibly powerful, and that I want to urge white people to contribute towards that fund and to support these campaigns. And that's another reason why we wanted to hold this panel is one, to expose these conditions and just make it absolutely clear that it is genocide against African people and white people have to say no more genocide in our name. Yeah. That is what we have to say. And also because Africans charge genocide, the Black Power Blueprint and arrest CPS are all fronts of the party yeah. that the Uhuru Solidarity Movement has to be a part of and has to build and support. So do we have unity with that? Yeah. Uhuru. Yeah. So what time is it? 4.38? Really? Wow. Are we way ahead of schedule? That's amazing. <laughs> Round of applause for that. <laughs> No idea how that happened. But um, we would like to open it up for, for questions for any of our incredible panelists. 
today. So please come to the mic if you have any questions or comments you would like to make to this panel. I would just it's possible if I could pass this around maybe? Would that be all right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Amwaloverroad.org. Thank you. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yes. Uh, Jackson, I know that um, it's been said on a lot of the USM and Black Power Blueprint web live shows, a statistic that Truman Penny, you have cited of, you know, every white baby um, uses or uses the resources of 35 colonized children, uh, including African children. And um, I think that, you know, it's really, you know, that even, you know, what's been said earlier in this convention of like, by the, the chairman of every, you know, white person, you know, lives because of this, this genocide. And, you know, we owe reparations even for just like, you know, for, you know, living on this pedestal for, you know, living our, our happy lives of, you know, children and families, like that comes at the expense of African people. And this, you know, genocide of the thieving of children is, you know, horrible. And um, I just wanted to um, unite with, you know, reparations and, you know, to everything in <laughs> real. Uhuru, my name is Hallie Murray. I'm the North Regional Coordinator of USM. I just want to appreciate all of these speakers. I mean, it's so powerful to just have the party, the African People's Socialist Party, speaking on these issues to, you know, a room full of white people, of USM organizers, and just how we can take this and go back into our white communities with all these campaigns and messages. And I think Jesse said earlier, like, we should focus think of our questions of like, how can we materialize what is being said? And like, like I'm always thinking like, how can we put this in the regional POA? So I just wanted to ask certain things. Like I saw that for the, um, the Africans Charge Genocide campaign, like there was an open position for a USM representative. So I thought I'd just say that again. Like if anyone here is interested in that, you know, you could, I'm sure talk to Colin. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You know, we could fill that position. Um, and also, I know you've mentioned it before, Jesse, that like other campaigns in the, like ANWA wanted to have a USM, or just like, I'm thinking of how we can move forward in, you know, filling those positions with this room of white people here. And also how, you know, how you anticipate the regional strat, or just how um, USM as an organization like, what are you thinking would be the next steps for us to take these campaigns and apply them, you know, like, a, we're having our tours committee, so would the Africans Charge Genocide Tour, like, can be connected with that, or with, like, the North region, you know, like, would these campaigns, just, like, I don't know, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, or if any of you have ideas for how to, like, materially take this and put it into the work of USM, like, in a... POA, because like I'm taking notes this whole weekend. I hope you are too. <laughs> Uhuru. Uhuru. Well, thank you for asking that. And that is something that we wanted to put forward in this workshop is there is a call from the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement for a solidarity representative to join the committee of the Africans Charged Genocide Campaign. And we wanted to really put that out there and see if there is interest in, in doing that. And if there is, please let us know. You can raise your hand, or you can let us know afterwards if you're thinking about it. And I don't know if President Kamabai, you want to say a little bit more about what that would entail. Yeah, I was just going to unite with that. Um, I know with African Short Genocide, you know, the USM rep, you know, we have a report, you know, um, that you would go into USM and um, make sure that at every table that we have the petition, um, putting our propaganda around African Short Genocide. Um, Etc. Um, with you know donation cans or whatever um, 
to be a part of that. And then the speaking tour, like it's a lot of places where EPDOM and USM is. And so those speaking tours, we were, we had an event in um, Portland and we had an event in Seattle. And pretty much the same way we did that with USM and EPDOM, having a combined event around African Shores genocide is what we want to do for the speaking tour. Um, and, you know, you know, and I know like with the Black Power Blueprint, you know, we have webinars every Tuesday and then they have like, tons of stuff where USM have been participating in that. And then you um, with uh, AMWO, you know, you know, that donation of $2,000, you know, like, you know, having a way of doing fundraisers to donate to those campaigns. So I really appreciate this pan campaign, um, this panel, because it's a campaign that moves. It's not just talking because, um, you know, standing in front of um, a room full of white people, just telling them of my black experience I'm not really interested in, unless it's actually, you know, trying to liberate African people and change the conditions that we experience. So that's why, you know, I appreciate this kind of panel, you know, because we have a whole bunch of crazy people that do stuff like that. Peru and KC, and I just really want to appreciate this panel. I thought it was really informative, and I loved hearing about how you know the Huru movement is getting at the root of all these. We saw all these issues like prison justice and drug policy reform, and then meeting the movement. I saw that you know you can't sacrifice the long-term goal for these short-term reforms, but the movement you know has this long-term vision of ending colonialism and all its symptoms while doing these short, really important important, you know, things that address the conditions that are happening right now, like with the CPS. I wanted to say to the white people in the room that a lot of us are already organizers, but I really want to see out of this convention, like, a deeper commitment from no matter what level you're already in to just take responsibility to lead and recruit more people and get more people involved because there's a lot that we have to do to build solidarity with all the work going on. So I just want to put that seed out there that if you're not at a position on a committee that, you know, you should really think about it. And, um, and my, the question that I had, though, was um, on the African Star Genocide campaign, I was wondering if President Columbia, if you could speak a little bit about um, the question of genocide and how the African Star Genocide relates to the Keep 28 campaign locally in St. Louis. <clears throat> well, Keep 28 is, you know, like what we're saying is they, is, is gen they gentrifying the city. You know, St. Louis um, is broken up with 28 wards. If you're not familiar with um, the 28 wards um, in St. Louis, so right now in St. Louis City is really black. And if you have experienced it, you know, you have to like, as Chairman said, you have to, and I never really paid, I grew up in St. Louis all my life. Um, and you know, all the stuff that's pushed on us is, you know, I wanted to get away from it. But I really appreciate St. Louis because you, you have to look really hard to find a white person you know, um, on the north side. But more and more, we starting to see the clipboards and the trucks driving in the community. And everything that they doing is to gentrify the city. And I asked myself, and I could be wrong, because I haven't talked to Chairman about this, but I said, why do they, why do they want to disperse African people? Because this same um, blueprint that they using for St. Louis, they use for Kansas City, they use for, you know, San Diego, they used for St. Pete, you know, they use this same thing. Like, when we look at it, you know, even at the electoral school, learning more and more, I see similarities of, like, their plan for the city-county merge is for them to be able to have districts and really take the vote away and stuff like that. Well, they have a problem because in St. Louis City is so black, we can organize in, like, because we right here together. <laughs> we can mobilize. Ferguson happened because the Africans were all in this one area and we took Florissant from here all the way to Florissant to Ferguson and a little past Ferguson, um, St. Louis County, that all that right there is black. That's a problem. So they need to disperse us so we can't talk to each other. We can't organize with each other. And, you know, that's sort of thinking about that. And, you know, anytime they do gentrification, that means death to African people. People die. Mm -hmm. um, people been living in, I mean, poverty is real, you know, in the African community. And some of these homes have been in people's family for generations to generations. Right across the street, the house where the African came over very politely because he know the Uhuru movement and asked us 
to move the car. Um, like he just got out of prison and that house have been in his family for generations, generations. If that's taken from him, he wouldn't have no place to go. Um, so this is like death to African people. It's not some small little cute thing. Gentrification is a horrible word and it's, it's genocide. So, you know, um, that's how the Keep 28 is connected to Africans' choice genocide because this is genocide. It's genocide and the reason why we're saying we need to keep 28 wards, like Chairman said, we need to create more wards, you know, because it's not a thing of that this ward is this this whole system is great, but if we have black power and we have you know um, 28 wars where African people um, like Jesse Todd that just won the election and Keep 28 is influencing you know more people in these wards, um, you know we have the ability to organize and be in the belly of the beast out there um, in that arena to push for black community control of the police because they talking about bringing the national guards into the third ward which where I live and where we have prop you know the black power blueprint have property at you know the national guards is not coming to solve problems they coming to you know bring havoc on the people um, in this in this community you know so that's genocide you know um, it's genocide because we don't have any more schools in this district I have to send my kids to school all the way somewhere for every day is stressful for me trying to figure out how I'm gonna get them from this school because it's no schools in this you, you drive you drive past you see all these schools they vacant you know what I'm saying so you know the the school system that's genocide that we can't even educate our kids you know and you seen there's no grocery stores absolutely food desert mm -hmm. where we living at and the black power blueprint is building every and everything that I just named they building into you know um, infrastructure to address all these different disparities and the most important thing is it allow the people to be able to participate because if we say we want to govern, we have to have experience in actually taking the responsibility of our life, which, you know, everything in the system have taught us to just sit down and let somebody else take, take control. But the Black Power Blueprint allowed people to participate in actually every person that built, put anything in this wall. Like I've seen how they was transformed from just being able to participate in hiring people that look like us. So that's how, you know, Keep 28, you know, connect itself to, you know, African shores genocide. Uh -huh. Um, I, well, I really want to appreciate this panel and this whole first day of the convention has been extremely powerful. Um, I think that I really appreciate Malika's presentation and in regards to how, you know, support the REST CPS campaign, you know, uh, financially, but also that point about the lawyers. Um, I think that's very important and it's also a resource that is in the white community um, who have the ability to even attend something like law schools and get degrees and things of that nature. And if you're in law school right now, I mean, because there used to be um, a movement of lawyers at some point in time that were at had you know a certain amount of courage to be able to you know go up and you know represent um, you know certain you know when we're dealing with different campaigns even within the party um, in the past and that the whole move those movement of lawyers don't exist anymore and it's very difficult to find a lawyer to do any type of work it is that we do and we have a lot I mean even when we're dealing with um, the electoral arena and wanting to do like ballot initiatives referendums and stuff like that you need attorneys to be able to you know work on these kinds of um, campaigns and you know in dealing with these different cases that is a real serious resource and um, so recruitment you know within the white community for you know revolutionary African internationalist lawyers to be able to um, you know to be able to be a part of this movement is really critical and I just appreciated that point uh -huh. Uhuru, um, first of all, thank you all so much for being here and thank you for um, being on this panel for us. Um, and I uh, wanted to ask this question earlier, but I was uh, busy uh, with mac and cheese. Um, but I, there's, okay, so I'm thinking of the Coltrane video that we watched a few minutes ago. And there's a particular quote in there that the chairman says, and it's something like, um, talking about black elected officials um, and saying that black elected officials aren't able to affect real change because of the absence of an independent economic base, I think are the words. Um, and so I'm wondering if uh, one of you wants to, 
wants to speak to that. And I guess my question is like, um, um, like speak to the difference between like an African person running for office versus an African or like a white person, you know, in Jesse's case, um, from the movement running for office. And like, what's, what's the strategy behind running for office right now? Or, uh, Chairman, did you want to <laughs> You know, uh, when we talk about the inability of African uh, politicians to represent the African community or how difficult it is because they don't work from like an independent economic base, but there are Africans who run for, they do run. Mm -hmm. So they, re they represent somebody. Yep. They represent some base. So why can't Jesse run for mayor in St. Petersburg uh, where the African population is 23%, you know, minority population. He represents somebody too. And he represents the economic and political aspiration of the African community tied to the African working class. So he's not just an individual white person, a do-goody, gooder, who's out there uh, to help the, the poor Negroes. He's there uh, under the leadership of the African working class. And uh, the fact is that we, uh, have uh, politicians, some of whom we appreciate so much, like Charles Barron. We, you heard him mention, uh, uh, and he's able to run, uh, and he does it independently. He's almost by himself. He's surrounded by African neo-colonial forces who he cannot even win to take the stance in the defense of African people, but he's done that. Uh, and he's tethered himself to the aspirations of the African working class. There's no doubt about that. His appreciation, love for the African People's Socialist Party. So even as he does not have an economic base, he's connected to a movement that is struggling to achieve and consolidate the African an economic base for the African working class. And then, of course, we have uh, Jesse Todd, who is here. And many of us are going to go, Jesse Todd is going to be sworn in. Uh, on Tuesday, and many of us are going to be there with him when he's sworn in, so everybody can know he's not there by himself, just representing the 18 ward, that we're going to raise up Jesse so he becomes an example of how everybody should be running and connected to the aspirations and the institutionalized power of the African working class through the relationship with the party. Uh, we had a case uh, uh, in Madison, Illinois. Uh, where um, a, a member of our movement, specifically the Keep 28 uh, campaign uh, in Madison, uh, Illinois, uh, just ran. This is plantation politics like nothing I've seen in my life. And nobody in this, well, let me take that back, but uh, a situation where one family, one white family, uh, has dominated that city, a, a small town, uh, for 30 years or more. And before that, a group of white people dominated it. And so you have uh, the Africans now become a majority, and a person who's associated with our movement runs, uh, tries to run for office, and first was kept off the ballot, her and every other African who was trying to run for office, because you didn't put a staple in the right place, because you, 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 you left off the, the, the dot on the I. I mean, silly stuff like this was happening, and they've done it in the past without any problem. But because this comrade was connected to our movement, she went in and fought them publicly, fought them, and that made them have to allow everybody else to get on the ballot. All the other Africans were on the ballot because of her. Then they say at the end of the election, all the other Africans won, but we lost by 18 votes. Now we are learning that the 18 votes we lost by cannot be accounted for. And so it's, uh, they took the election. It's like, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's incredible. And we're going to make that fight, too. But the point that we're making is that they're not standing alone. They're standing on the base of the African working class. And, uh, and we're growing every day. And you're here as a part of that base. And we are spreading everywhere. We're talking about Elizabeth Warren and all these other people talking about reparations. There are 37 states where reparations is being talked about, at least as a consequence of the existence of Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Yes. That's not that's 37 states. That's, that's powerful. That's, Lizzie, Lizzie can't take this from us. You understand? This is, this is the African working class. It's our demand. 
at a time when nobody else was making that struggle. We've been making and building that struggle, and you're here today as a consequence of that. And this is also the significance of the party. This, by the way, is your party. And you have to fight for this party just like you fight for everything else. When this party, how do they destroy the revolution? They destroy the vehicle of the revolution. They kill leaders and they destroy organization. They do everything they can to break the unity of the revolutionary, of the revolution, destroy the will of the people. Yes. And when you see anything attacking the party, well, look, they're attacking 50, what, 46 years of history of resistance, struggle, and building everything that you see. We've done that. So it's not just like they want to, they don't like somebody or they don't like who is sleeping with whom. Uh, it's an attempt to destroy the project of the African working class to make a revolution that will, will free humanity and free the African working class and free the oppressed peoples of the world. That's your party. There's no way you can be on the sideline watching that attack happen or on any of these other questions. You can't be on the sideline watching and will try to do what it has to do in order, in the interest of the African women, you can't do this, and watching what's happened to the, because the party takes on the whole question. It's not a single issue organization. It's an all issue organization. The party has to lead everything, every aspect, every question has to be under the leadership of the, the advanced detachment of the African working class. That's your struggle, your party, as, uh, as well as it is my party, and when it's under attack, you have to be first in line uh, to defend it. Ruby, there are pictures of Ruby. Yeah. Somebody said Ruby uh, took some stance. I remember, I forgot what it was in this case, uh, whether the police or somebody was uh, harassing uh, uh, a Klumbayi. That ain't the first time. I uh, think the first time there are photos of Ruby uh, with cops got chokeholds on her, got her on her belly with her knees in her back. Uh, defending the revolution. Raya, uh, the first time Raya was missing from one of the most important meetings we had in New York. She met us when we were organizing the first tribunal for reparations for African people in 1982. Why isn't Raya at the meeting? I'm upset. Find out Raya is not at the meeting because on the way to the meeting, she saw a cop uh, beating a Puerto Rican and she jumped on the cop. This is who we are. We defend it. We defend the party. We defend the revolution. All of us have that responsibility. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you, Chairman. All right. So where are we at with time now? OK, we're great. But I just wanted to say, I wanted to be self-critical that I did not bring to this workshop a concrete resolution that we could adopt to build these campaigns. And I will rectify that by bringing that tomorrow. So please be here tomorrow because we will have, we have elections tomorrow and we will also vote and I'll be consulting with Chairman Penny on the language of that resolution um, and bringing that to our general membership tomorrow so that we can all take a vote to adopt a resolution on how we're going to go forward in this upcoming year to build Africans Charged Genocide, to build Arrest CPS, to build these amazing campaigns. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yes. Uhuru. Sure. Uhuru. You know, um, I just really appreciate everything. Oh, I'm sorry, Deputy Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead. OK. Um, I just really appreciate what Chairman just said. And in St. Louis, it's not a fact that we have had African people not in office. Do you hear what I said? Because since Ferguson, like we have a whole bunch of young tattoos on the face, just all kind of opportunists. And we have, and that's why African and nationalist is so important because it teaches you how to listen. Because somebody could get up here and tell you a real horrific story. I can get up here and tell you a real horrific black experience, but we need a theory that is going to change the world, kick a pluralism butt, and, you know, overturn this relationship that we have with it. And so just having a black person with a black experience is not good enough. You know what I'm saying? We are not looking to fill these wards or black people in office that is just going to afford a white agenda. Do you hear what I'm saying? I really need people to listen to what people say. And, you, and it's easy because you can look at what they're doing. Like, what have they built beyond their self in an event? 
You know what I'm saying? What have they built to actually change the conditions of African people? So people could say what they will or may about the Uhuru movement, but they could not take, like we have, we can talk the talk because we can, we walk the walk, we do the work. You know what I'm saying? You sitting in a Uhuru house from Ferguson. You got people in, you know, in elect, they just got a salary. But like the conditions of African people have not changed. So I just really wanted to say that, that you know, just simply having black people in office is just not good enough. Mm -hmm. So please listen to the people that you, you cheering for. Like, what are they doing? I don't care if you, I mean, all of us know somebody in jail. All of us been to funerals before because we're black and this is genocide. So we, that has been accomplished. Where are we going at, where are we going now is the question, Uhuru. So, can we get one final round of applause? Oh, we have a question. I'm so sorry. No, 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 I just want to just, you know, just appreciate this workshop. I mean, like, I mean, all you Africans sitting up there, you know, I've worked with, you know, each and every one of you, and I'm just really, really proud right now uh, that you represent the people. And uh, I know that being in a party that uh, the s decisions that we make is based, you know, on, you know, a strategy um, for us to move forward. But, you know, I would welcome to see any one of you run for office in some kind of capacity <laughs> to, to really fight, no, really fight for the community yeah. and fight for our people, because we have to do that. We have to, like Chairman said, we have to step in that arena now. And, you know, it's not because we want to be elected officials, but we got to represent. Yes, yes, that's what I was saying. I was just, yeah. Um, just, and uh, I just, again, just want to appreciate um, this panel and, and Abdul, I just really appreciate because, you know, I was raised, I have five brothers and all five of them have been in prison and just coming out of, you know, prison and seeing the conditions that they face you know, not able to get a job because they got, you know, a record and, you know, very capable of working. You know, like Chairman said, we used to, you know, with slavery, we didn't have to go piss in a cup or anything like that. You know, the, our, our, um, our labor was free. And now that we have capable young men and women out there that has been, you know, locked up for no reason at all, like we say, let, we have to let them all go. I really appreciate your presentation and pre appreciate your stance you know, on um, the question of African prisoners. And uh, we are in the Black Power Blueprint. You know, one of the programs that we're building is called the African Internationals, International uh, Workforce Program that's gonna be under the umbrella of Uhura Foods and Pies. So we are going to be teaching Africans how to be in business and how to, um, you know, uh, conduct themselves in the food industry. So I'm just really, really excited about um, everything that's coming out of this convention and um, you know we just have to really really fight to move you know from this place to another place and I know that all of us engage into different organizations but we have to really fight to make it all happen we have to make really fight to make it happen and I just again want to appreciate this this um, workshop Uhura. 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 Uhuru comrades, um, I came into the movement with Columbia, and I've seen the growth, and every time the chairman puts forth something, it blooms like a flower. And I want to appreciate you, chairman, for the African People's Socialist Party, and I'm just so proud of y'all. I see the vision, and it's going to be great. Uhuru. 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 Uh, I'm sorry. I want to really salute this panel. It was so powerful. I yes. just really want to. Uhuru. And I do really want us to not only have a resolution, but to really incorporate the document for the um, the the. Africans charged genocide mm -hmm. document, which is yes. very winning and very powerful, and also, you know, second what President Columbine was saying, because 
um, 10,000 people have, have signed that online. And it, it, it's really, and almost everybody has an incredible statement that they yeah. say why they're signing it, which is also very powerful to read. And I think that this is something that we absolutely need to bring into the solidarity movement. And we're talking about, I know it was said that there's a tour committee now. Mm -hmm. And I think that these tours should be, need to be brought into the tour committee mm -hmm. so that we can do what President Columbine was saying, you know, bring them to key areas, this question. It's, it's so powerful, it's so winning, and it really shows colonialism and the colonial contradiction. And, you know, I just, I just really want to say that that would be the resolution, that would be one of the resolutions yes. in addition to somebody joining the different yeah. committees that were called for. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman Penny. <coughs> Uhuru. I think it's really important uh, to understand uh, that prison, among other things, is a form of birth control. Uh, it is, it speaks directly to the whole question of genocide as defined uh, by that convention, uh, especially with the number of young men that get lock, get, gets locked up. Uh, in, in general, in this country right now, uh, for every 100 African women, there are only 82 men. In Ferguson, for every 100 women, there are only 62 African men. Mm. You can just think about the chaos, the social chaos that uh, creates. Uh, and it has implications that people don't even think about because they're not thinking about the fact, well, hell, and there are only 82 African men for every 100 African women. No one's thinking about that. But it has powerful consequences, social consequences in our community. It makes us act certain ways that we probably would not act if that were not the case. Ferguson, only 62 60 or so, 60 African men for every 100 African women. The social implication, that's colonialism. Yes. That's a form of genocide. That's how yes. prison, the prison question, the genocide question, everything that we are talking about, they're all connected under colonialism. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for us to understand that. It's not, that is as dangerous as the ones who are putting us in these prisons. Yes. That's where, those are where the thugs and dangerous uh, forces are located at. And that's something that we have to understand. So I just wanted to, to make that uh, observation. Uhuru. 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 Completely unite them. So we just want to see if there's any other comments any of our panelists would like to make. Yes. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to say that I first got locked up when I was 18. 1979 and for robbing white people and they gave me 20 years first offense they gave me I actually did nine years and seven months in prison so when I got out I was bitter and angry you know I didn't do anything in prison I didn't get a I already had a GED but I didn't get a I didn't try to take advantage of college all I did was gamble play basketball did so when I got out I was worse off than I was when I went in Nobody tried to, hey, you need to get in school, you need to do this, you need to train yourself, you need to habilitate yourself. You know, so I got, consequently, I got out being angry. And I was a black nationalist. I was listening to the teachings of Minister Farrakhan, Elijah Muhammad. So I, I didn't really hate white people, but I didn't like them. You know, because I felt that they were responsible for the condition that I was in. So, but when I went back to prison, when I got that 55 years, and in the state of Illinois, you have to do half of whatever they give you. So they gave me 55 years. So that meant I had to do 27 and a half years in prison, right? So I said, well, this time I'm not going to be the same fool that I was when I went in. I'm going to educate myself. So I got a associate's degree. I got a bachelor's degree. I wrote a book. I did all type of study. Became a teacher's aide responsible for hundreds of brothers getting a GED. So I just changed myself all the way around. But what, what bothered me, what what concerned me, what affected me deeply was that I saw so many black men in prison. And in the state of Illinois, 63% of the prison op, uh, population consists of black males. So I did a study. I, that's what I did my thesis on. I wanted to know why so many black men were in prison. 
And it's because of the policing that they do of the, of the black community. In 1980-something, the FBI said that, that the average crack smoker was a 30-year-old male Caucasian. But you don't see him present in prison. At, by the time I was 15 years old, I had like 18 to 19 police contact. I found that out in court. But you know what they classify as a police contact? When well, they pull you over, when you're walking down the street in your own community and neighborhood and shake you down and pat you down and see if you got a gun, if you got some reef, or if you got anything. So if they were doing the same thing that they was doing to us in the white community, they would be there. 63% of them would be there, not 63% of us, because they dominate us. There's more of them than us. But in the state of Illinois, black men constitute 63% of the prison population. Uh, blacks only, con in the state of Illinois, blacks only constitute 14% of the entire population. So at best, the black male could only be 7%, but he's less than that, probably 6%. But 63% of the prison population, so he's there 10 times his number in the society. So that's by design. It's keeping you away from the legitimate uh, economy. So you have to go to this underworld economy, keeping you deprived of the resources that you need to sustain yourself. So you have to become a criminal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's Uhuru. Sure. I, just, I just think it's extremely important to understand the question of colonialism. When you say you have to become a criminal, you have to break the law, it's colonial law. It's a colonial law that they make laws that meet the requirements of colonial society. Colonial society, there are a group of people who are colonized, there are groups of people who are colonized, and they are easily identifiable. Uh, whatever kinds of jobs or work they have, the whole African nation lives under colonialism. The whole Mexican nation lives under colonialism. All of these people are colonized, and you know how you know they're colonized? Because how they look, generally speaking, how they look. And so when you talk about the law and the number of people, it's, crime has nothing to do with it. The criminals make the law. If bank robbers made the law, bank robbing would be legal. Uh, but bank robbers do make the law, and the way they rob the bank is legal. It's the way you rob the bank that makes it illegal. The bank robbers are ripping off everybody all the time. All the time. And, and the difference is, the difference is that the bankers rob the bank with computers. Right. And you have, you don't have computers and banks of computers and other forces, universities and stuff working for you. The thing, you got a, you got a, you got a primitive weapon to go rob the bank with. You got a gun. And the, the real thieves don't use it. They don't have to use it. And I think that's, and then what they do is they make serious crime, what the crime that, the working class, so you can get serious criminal charges if you got a gun. I don't know of criminal charges, I really do not know of criminal charges being pressed, generally speaking, against anybody who uses an Apache helicopter. Yeah. Right. Right? Yes. Anybody who's using a nuclear submarines. Right. Or those white college kids who are in Colorado who can send missiles and bombs and things like that to kill yeah. people in Afghanistan. Right. It's just this, this primitive means of, of, of uh, expropriating that we do. And I heard uh, Ben say something that I've only heard Africans say in the past, uh, of reparating. <laughs> you understand? Turn reparation to a verb, right? And so, uh, you know, you go in there and do and reparate it, and, uh, and that's, that's uh, illegal. But at the end of the day, I just want us to remember this. The struggle for reparation is critical. Kamala, uh, Elizabeth... The rest of them, the baby bonds, they're not going to do it. Mm -mm. It's just like when you saw the revolutionary movement in China, and when it reached a certain pitch, and the masses of the peasants understood that the land ought to be theirs, it wasn't the law of, in China uh, that say, okay, give the peasants the land. It was relations. You don't have to wait for a decision from any court, any legislators, or anything like that. You're going to see Africans who live in these communities going out and, as Ben said, reparating. Yeah. Right? Uh, and and that's, the, that's when the masses become unleashed. That's the thing they will never be, and that's, they will never be able to control this revolutionary project when the people understand that what's in that refrigerator belongs to me. Mm -hmm. And what's in that car belongs to me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that also, that also neutralizes this colonial state. 
Because the colonial state can only be affected to the extent that you believe in it. When you get arrested and go to, and they take you to court and put you in jail, it can only work when you believe in it. And not only you, but everybody else who's locked up believe in the system. Even if they don't like the system, they believe in the legitimacy of the system because they don't have an alternative. We're giving them an alternative. We're showing them a vision as a free people, but the only way you can get there is you're going to have to destroy the colonial state. That means the prison system. That means the cops on your community. That means the FBI, CIA, that means uh, spy stations that they set up in your community in North uh, uh, St. Louis. All of that stuff got to go uh, as, a, as, a, as a part of the project for us to be liberated. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yeah. Uhuru. All right, I want to thank Chairman Omalia Tatella and our amazing panelists. Can we give one more round of applause for this incredible and powerful panel? Uhuru. And once again, I want to state my own self-criticism for not having a resolution, but we will have it. We'll have it printed out for everyone to review tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, we have an amazing presentation that Chairwoman Penny is going to give in the morning. And then immediately following that, I'm tasked with presenting on the tour strategy. So at the very beginning of my presentation, I'm going to present the resolutions on USM building solidarity with these campaigns that we just heard about. So. We will have the opportunity to review that and vote to adopt that to guide our work moving forward. Uhuru. Uhuru. <laughs> All right, so we have um, one more item on the program for tonight, which is our culture and awards night, which is going to be very exciting. We have, uh, it's called Build the Culture of Reparations to African People. We have some cultural performances from some of our comrades to showcase the emerging revolutionary culture of reparations that has come up in the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And we also have awards for outstanding achievements of members, organizers of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement in the past year. So we want to go ahead and take a break. And dinner will be uh, ready shortly. So we'll be letting everybody know. And we want to have everybody come back at 6. And you, know, you can continue eating um, while we are, yes, do we have an announcement? Dinner's good. Can the food coordinator introduce the meal? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, and we are, before we go to dinner, we're going to have a group photo. Thank you for reminding me of that. We are going to have a group photo, so don't go anywhere. Uhuru. Um, just to wake everybody up, uh, unity through? Reparations! Unity through? Reparations! Reparations now! Reparations now! now. now. Uhuru. Okay, so um, I first want to salute um, my food team. So Wendy, Rose, Valerie, Virginia, Gill, and Meadow have been amazing. So yeah. And thank you all so much. You've been incredible. I couldn't do it without you. I also want to salute um, Hallie, Mara, Anne, Allie, Chair Jesse, and KC for also all being, you know, a part of making all of the food happen for this weekend. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, if you can't tell from the aroma that has been stewing all day, we're having uh, vegan chili, um, cornbread, and salad. <laughs> Give it up for vegan chili and cornbread. Um, and there's lots of chilies, and the bowls are really small. So come back for seconds and thirds and fourths if you want to. Like, um, I want you all to leave full and happy. Um, and uh, we also have a fresh pot of coffee in the back, so help yourself. And <laughs> okay, that's all. Um, enjoy. Uhuru. And let's give a round of applause for Comrade Carly. Uhuru. Carly has done a great job coordinating this, so we really salute and appreciate Carly. And now we would like to gather for a group photo. So if everyone could come to the front, we've done it. We did it on the stage usually, so. Yes, so if everybody could come gather at the stage. Yes. So we don't need anybody standing in front. Um, yes. Um, All right. Yeah. 